of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, January 8th, 2024. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Uh, next is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented to the minutes of the January 4th, 2024 meeting. I'll second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Uh, we don't need any discussion on this. Uh, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Now we have the public session. Anyone that would like to address any items not on the warned agenda, uh, please come forward. And I ask that you uh, uh, keep your comments to three minutes if possible. If you need more time, we'll be glad to add it to the agenda in the ensuing meeting. Yes, um, Tom. I got a request just today um, to testify in front of Senate operations on Wednesday about the municipal flood response and, and in essence, um, how are the interactions between state and town government? Hmm. So yeah. I, will, I will testify Wednesday afternoon, but I just thought maybe we should have a conversation about that and get some input from the board. Okay. Um... Do you mind putting that at the end of the agenda? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Do that right before uh, the next meeting discussion. Anything else? Then uh, I uh, understand Brian Voigt is joining us uh, via Zoom. Brian, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Uh huh. Great. Great. Uh, Brian, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've uh, agreed to present us uh, with some options uh, on uh, flood water mitigation. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just Introducing yourself uh, with uh, your title and uh, your uh, brief uh, bit on your uh, position uh, within the state, and then uh, go forward. Sure, happy to do so. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Brian Boyd. I'm a senior planner and program manager at the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, my apologies that I couldn't make it there tonight in person, but uh, recent car troubles has uh, the household down to one vehicle, and I'm sure you all understand how that goes uh, living in rural Vermont. So uh, here I am uh, reporting out to you from uh, from Montpelier. I'm, uh, I've been at the Regional Planning Commission for about 18 months. Uh, I'm the, the lead natural resources planner and uh, also um, head up the uh, the GIS geographic information systems work here uh, with the organization. Uh, my primary responsibility here is uh, a focus on natural resources with a, a real uh, heavy amount of that workload allocated to uh, working on issues of water quality and and water quantity. Um, and to that end, I'm the the team lead on the clean water service provider program for the Winooski River Basin. And I'll touch on that uh, in a few minutes here as I go through my, my presentation. Am I able to share my screen? I notice it's it's disabled. Can we change that? Or I'm otherwise happy I could email Tom my presentation yeah. right now, or we could do without and I can just talk about my slides however you see fit. Karen's given you authority to share your screen. Sounds dangerous. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so hopefully you can see uh, a slide that says opportunities for flood hazard mitigation. Are we on the same yeah. page? Okay, Thank great. You. Okay, well, I've already introduced myself, uh, so I won't won't bother doing uh, that uh, bit again. Um, I'm going to talk 
tonight about uh, a few different things related to um, flood hazard mitigation. And I'm gonna start out with a, a brief overview of stormwater master planning. And then I'm gonna talk about a few different funding opportunities and really wanna leave plenty of time for a, a brainstorm session with, uh, with the select board members of the public that are attending the meeting tonight to talk about, um, you know, in your ideal world, what would the next steps uh, look like and talk about what role CVRPC could play in facilitating uh, those next steps. So I'll kick it off with, uh, again, a brief discussion of, of stormwater master planning. So, you know, why, why plan? Why, what's up with these stormwater master plans? Many of our urban areas and impervious surfaces predate the statutory, statutory requirements for stormwater management. So we're already sort of starting from behind the eight ball, if you will. And really the, the goal with stormwater master plans is to focus on water quality improvements and uh, minimizing downstream impacts from, from floodwaters. Um, we operate on the, uh, the old adage, preventive, uh, prevention is cheaper than restoration. So if we can target these areas where we're seeing increased pollution or excess um, stormwater runoff, uh, we can capture and hopefully remove or mitigate that situation more efficiently at its point of origin, as opposed to dealing with um, recovering and repairing uh, downstream damages following an event. What does a, a stormwater master plan produce? Uh, a list of prioritized projects and or best management practices, things like green stormwater infrastructure and low impact development policies that can both help um, repair uh, past damages, but also look towards the future to hopefully avoid uh, repeating some of the mistakes of the past. And then the other nice uh, and very essential component of a stormwater master plan is this um, public participation piece. So increasing public awareness about stormwater problems, identifying opportunities for community action, and also um, daylighting the, the cost of uh, engineered and other solutions, helping the community make sense of the potential financial ramifications of uh, project implementation, and then also helping them contextualize an outlay of money that they may not consider as something worthwhile by uh, addressing or explaining uh, what has happened uh, via past events and uh, the costs associated with post-storm post recovery in the past. So a little bit of background on stormwater master plans. Um, uh, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation has worked on this um, topic since the, the late 1990s with a, a staff position supporting urban watershed management in the year 2000. Um, the legislature passed a Vermont stormwater management statute um, that among other things promote, promotes implementation of pollution prevention uh, encourages municipal governments to utilize existing regulatory and planning authority to um, uh, implement improved stormwater management and promote this public education and participation among citizens with a goal of achieving uh, cost-effective and innovative measures to reduce stormwater uh, discharges. So the overarching goal really is to target locations where this pollution is generated so that we can capture and, and mitigate this in a, a cost-effective manner. So the stormwater master plan is essentially a comprehensive plan for addressing stormwater runoff. And a typical process for um, stormwater master planning includes things like um, defining the water quality or quantity problem through existing data. So things like biological, chemical monitoring, uh, river geomorphic assessments. So things that already exist uh, within the, the state library, so to speak. Um, we would gather existing data, so make use of our extensive uh, spatial data resources from the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. We might look at uh, existing reports or <clears throat> existing data analysis if either or both of those uh, exist. And then in addition, uh, some new data collections. So field surveys to uh, compile a list of potential sites that are contributing to stormwater problems or water quality pollution problems, uh, conducting a limited amount of field data analysis, 
um, compiling that list of sources uh, associated with these defined water problems. And really the, um, you know, the end goal here is uh, a list of prioritized projects that can lead to um, the selection of projects deemed feasible by the community um, that we can then advance for uh, funding and implementation. So currently the, um, the town does not have a stormwater master plan, but some work was done in the um, uh, 2009 timeframe by the state DEC uh, to map some stormwater infrastructure in both um, Waterbury Center and uh, the town of Waterbury. And um, how, how this differs from a, a stormwater master plan is that essentially it's DEC staff that gather available information. So they might look at anything from um, municipal plans for stormwater infrastructure to uh, site design or permit um, issued permits related to site design to gather any available information they can about um, the way that stormwater is being managed throughout uh, a municipality. So this um, effort resulted in a, a table, don't worry about the, the numbers or even really the, the field headings. Suffice it to say that there's a, this catalog of stormwater infrastructure throughout the, um, throughout the town. The uh, this information is a bit dated, it's uh, 14 or so years old at this point, but it does include um, a potential place for us to start beyond uh, the, the projects that, uh, that Tom and I have discussed uh, briefly in, in a, a past few phone calls. So the nice thing about this is that um, the outcome of this uh, stormwater mapping effort by, by DEC produces this list of potential projects. And we get, get us an idea about um, the amount of throughput going through these different project locations, both in terms of the quantity of water, but also uh, importantly, any pollutants uh, associated with that flow of water. And in particular, um, we're talking here about um, phosphorus. And I'll, I'll come back to why that is important later when I talk a bit more about some of our, our funding options. Um, last thing I'll say about this, this table is that maybe you can see some, some color-coded uh, cells here on the, uh, the left-hand side of the table. There's also a, a loose prioritization, again, not um, based on uh, an, any actual um, sophisticated modeling. They actually use a fairly simple approach to modeling the sediment and phosphorus loads in these locations, but the, the document itself is at least internally consistent, and we could use this as a jumping off point for identifying um, potential areas for greater scrutiny if uh, the town chose to go through a, a full-blown stormwater master planning process. So what does that process actually look like? Um, this is something that, uh, I mean, it certainly could be handled uh, in-house if you had the the required staff to, to do this. But um, typically when we engage stormwater master planning, we procure an engineering consultant. Um, we've worked with several different uh, engineering firms to work on stormwater master plans throughout the central Vermont region. So we procure an engineering consultant and the Planning and Conservation Commissions really play a, a significant role in this effort. And that that's not to sideline the select board. The select board is encouraged and certainly could be as involved as uh, they have time to, uh, to engage this um, activity. But we use this uh, the public input from planning and conservation commissions and uh, active citizens to generate a list of potential problem sites. Uh, the engineer engineering team would then uh, perform an initial analysis, generate a, a list of uh, 20 to 30 potential projects interface with, uh, again, the Planning and Conservation Commissions and uh, the Select Board as well, to really set up um, a more prioritized list of projects. So from that initial uh, tranche of 30 or more projects, um, it gets narrowed down to about 20 projects, and then typically anywhere from three to five of those 20 projects go through a, a preliminary engineering design. Uh, the state refers to this as a 30% design. So they distinguish between this preliminary or 30% design with a 100% uh, or final design, which is the last thing that happens prior to um, project implementation. So the document that, um, that comes out of this process, and there are several different templates depending on 
the area of focus anywhere from uh, individual site uh, all the way up to entire municipalities or potentially even uh, sub basins within the the Lake Champlain uh, drainage area. Um, but the the output of this is a a document that includes uh, details of the entire process and uh, more importantly, really sets us up for the the three to five projects. Um, puts us in a good position to pursue uh, pursue additional funding, be it from uh, federal or state resources to, to complete uh, the implementation of these projects. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a significant education and outreach component involved here, uh, looking to involve the public really at every phase of the, um, the master planning process uh, with the end goal of building awareness about the um, the current concerns and what it's going to take to um, implement these changes moving into the future. And I should mention also um, a really interesting example and, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission doesn't have, a, have a, a parallel to this, but it's something that we um, internally have discussed as a, a possibility moving forward, but the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission has a, a stormwater education program called Rethink Runoff. Um, again, really geared towards uh, reaching the, the public and um, helping build consensus around the work that needs to be done uh, related to stormwater management. So that's the uh, stormwater master planning process in a, a nutshell. I'm certainly happy to answer questions uh, either now or can wait until um, I run through just a handful of additional slides, but I'll take a, a quick break here. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff. <clears throat> How long will this process of implementing a master plan typically take place? Um, I'm not sure I totally heard the question. How, how long is the master planning process or how long is it from yes. the master? Okay. Yeah, so... Um, on the order of months, six months to maybe eight. Um, this is something that could be completed uh, certainly within a calendar year. So the soonest we would be budgeting for such a function would be 2025. Well, let's not get out ahead of the budget uh, discussion just yet because I do have some potential funding options where we wouldn't necessarily look to the town to fund that, or if we did, it would be uh, a small slice of um, of matching funds and not necessarily, uh, um, well, depending on how you do your, your budgeting, it might be something that you could work into uh, existing um, uh, budget buckets, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, for a stormwater master plan, if we were to target the uh, the entire um, municipality, then we're talking on the order of um, you know thirty five to fifty thousand dollars. That would be the town's portion. No, no, that would be the the whole um, the whole cost of a, a stormwater master plan. Yeah, sorry, didn't didn't mean to suggest that uh, thirty five to fifty k is pocket change for for anybody's budget. Yeah. Okay. And well, you'll you'll get into what it might cost uh, the town, depending on uh, in your succeeding discussion, right? Yeah, and we can and we can certainly talk more about that, um, you know, beyond this evening as well. Okay. Yeah, Chris. So is he is he specifically talking about a master plan that encompasses all like all the tributaries and? Potential stormwater runoff throughout the entire town of Waterbury, or are you talking about just the needs that municipality itself and the property that they encompass? In other words, are you talking all private <coughs> projects as well? Yeah. So it, the um, the the plan can address both public and uh, private lands, and so you know the question about does it does it address all the the tributaries this is not a um a stormwater modeling exercise typically the the way the process works is after the engineering consultant's been procured then we would meet with um whatever uh, group planning commission conservation commission select board all of the above and generate this list of potential problem sites you're the ones that know your your community the best and so you can think about 
Um, where do I see standing water after uh, uh, even a moderate rainfall? Um, where do I know that uh, we've got issues with uh, blown out culverts or undersized um, uh, bridges? You know, identifying projects like that, that uh, we can then task the uh, engineering consultant with uh, digging in further. So some of those locations may very well fall on private property. And that's another reason to engage the, the public about this. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, not every private landowner would be all that excited to post uh, stormwater infrastructure on their property. And that's their prerogative as the, the private landowner. So that would influence that final list of projects um, and in particular, that list of the three to five that go through the, the preliminary design, that 30% engineering design. We certainly wouldn't want to advocate for a 30% design on a project where a landowner has said, um, that's not something I'm interested in pursuing. Any other questions? All right, Brian, why don't you go ahead? Okay, great, thanks. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about three different uh, funding opportunities and um, talk about uh, or discuss how I think they um, they do or don't fit with uh, stormwater master planning and also the opportunities that they present, uh, even if they don't um, fully address the, the complete stormwater master planning process. So I'll talk about the hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program, and then lastly, the, the Formula Grant uh, Clean Water Service Provider Program. So the first of these, the, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, and I'll, um, I should mention, I will send this slide deck to Tom uh, so that he can distribute uh, further and or just put this up on the, the town website. And I have uh, hyperlinks to the different uh, grant programs in the slide deck that uh, you'd be able to access uh, easily if anyone wants to do uh, additional background work here. So the hazard mitigation grant program, this is money that was made available following the, the July 2023 flooding event. And it's uh, money that comes through the Federal Emergency Management Agency and it's administered by the Vermont Emergency, Va uh, Vermont Emergency Management, VEM. Um, it's important to note that damage from the flood is not required as part of your proposal. So the money itself is released in response to the July, uh, in, in response to a flooding event. In, in this particular case, we're talking about the July 2023 flood. Um, and you don't need to have realized specific damage to um, infrastructure or a property that might uh, fall under this proposal during that event. It's just that uh, the money becomes available following these, uh, these large scale events. Um, this has a 75% federal, 25% local cost share. And um, if, the, if the town has any ARPA funds still remaining, ARPA money can in many cases be used as the, the local match for this. Um, How about any state money? involved with this one? Uh, no. Okay. Um, that said, well, let me just say maybe and, and then come back to that because it's actually a, a slightly more complicated question than just a, a yes or no thing. So when I talk about the Clean Water Service Provider Program, um, I can talk about how that money can maybe be used as a match and technically that money comes from the state, but um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge here in a few minutes. Um, in yeah. terms of... Eligibility. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry to uh, interrupt, Ryan. Uh, Tom, Tom's going to give us a little insight. We've had conversations about hazard mitigation grants, Winooski Street being one project, the Culver we lost and we lost on Greg Hill Road being another. You can speak up just a little bit. Um, Stephanie Smith, who's in charge of the program at the state, has said, "Don't apply five times. Apply once. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're administering five grants instead of one." Um, the challenge with the 25% match is it has to be non-federal and so many state grants uh -huh. have a federal component to them too so that's the long and short of it okay yeah. Th thanks tom for for mentioning that you you've talked with stephanie i, I was uh, meant to bring that up as well and I, i'll just let me just uh, address this uh the local cost share piece um the the clean water service provider program 
you are allowed to use uh, some of that money to serve as match for federal projects. I would need to get the approval from DEC for that, um, but it is it is possible. Um, whether or not that, um, well, it, it's possible, but it, it does also present some other complications, and we can talk about um, what those might be when I when I touch on that uh, program in a little more detail. Um, but there are options for for cost sharing anywhere from from ARPA to the municipal tax base to potentially some fairly um, restricted funds that uh, that that may work for this. Um, so we've got a few different eligibility requirements. There needs to be a, a FEMA approved and adopted local hazard mitigation plan. My colleague Keith Coven is uh, currently working with uh, town staff on this with uh, an anticipated completion date. I believe he told me in summer of 2024. Um, good standing with the National Flood Insurance Program. We can check that box for you. And then also an adopted local emergency management plan, another uh, another box that we can check. So really the, the outstanding issue here is the local hazard mitigation plan. But given that there is a, a work in progress, we can also apply for a waiver uh, from that requirement. And that essentially means that the town's going to commit to wrapping up that local hazard mitigation plan within, uh, I believe it's 12 months of receiving the hazard mitigation grant of uh, funding itself. So um, it's it's not necessarily a workaround. We still have to commit to getting that local hazard mitigation plan done, um, but it's not a complete obstacle for seeking these funds uh, just because that uh, work has not been completed. So typical project types for funding under this kind of opportunity, uh, dam removal, upsizing a, a bridge or culvert, uh, floodplain restoration, and even engineering design for elevating residential properties or uh, commercial municipal uh, property uh, flood proofing. So this goes back to the, the point that Tom made. Um, we should really have a conversation about um, the the diversity or the range of projects that the, the town is interested in um, scope some costs for what that might look like, and then make some decisions about um, the projects that do or don't make the cut for uh, for the proposed funding. Um, I will note uh, that there is an application deadline uh, at the end of the month um, for this uh, current round of funding, and that the other uh, important piece to note here is that um, for projects that are funded through the Hazard mitigation grant program, the, the scoping um, projects that are funded under this are also expected to then pursue funding within the, the same funding cycle um, for project implementation. So that's uh, another another piece that um, maybe uh, might constrain the, uh, the list of projects that would be included on a, a grant proposal to this program. Um, a typical scoping pro uh, process here involves procuring engineering services, and it's going to be this engineering consultant uh, that would work with the RPC if you want us involved, as well as the town to uh, assess the issue or issues that are present and develop a, a list of alternatives. They would work with the, the project team, the project partners to select a, a preferred alternative and then develop um, some designs, a budget, and a, a real scope of that preferred alternative, in addition to a, a benefit cost analysis um, in order to set the stage for pursuing uh, implementation funding. So um, much like the, this idea of this 30% design for uh, um, projects in the stormwater master planning, you're gonna scope um, a project or a set of projects, develop your preferred alternative, and really advance those to the, the design stage so that you're well positioned to uh, solicit additional funding for implementation. So this, um, this particular funding opportunity, it, it is probably not the best fit for pursuing money to do a, a full-blown stormwater master plan, but I do think this would be good for some of these isolated projects. And, and Tom and I have talked about uh, at least a couple of them. I'm sure there are some other ideas floating around that I'd, I'd um, certainly like to hear about as well. Um, 
but uh, you know, my conversation with uh, with Stephanie and my understanding of the this grant program is that it might not be the the best fit for pursuing um, stormwater master plan funding. So we'll just um, put that in our back pocket for now and uh, move on to the other funding opportunities, and then we'll we'll circle back in the in the discussion piece here. Um, the next. Next opportunity I want to mention is this uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program, also known as the, the BRIC Grant Program. Um, so unlike the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program that we just discussed, this um, funding opportunity is uh, it's an annual program. So uh, FEMA administers funding annually um, to essentially um, fund hazard mitigation activities uh, with, the, with the end goal of reducing risk from natural hazards. It's really a pre-disaster mitigation program. Now, um, FEMA sets aside $2 million for the, the state of Vermont. Uh, my understanding is if there's a project of national significance, and I'm not exactly sure how that's defined, but uh, I'm, you know, if we come up with a really big, big project idea. I'm certainly happy to coordinate with our, our regional FEMA administrators to, to talk in more detail about what that looks like. Um, but if we did come up with a, a very large project, it is possible um, to ask for uh, funding in excess of, of $2 million. Once again, we've got a, a federal local cost share, uh, same basic idea where the, the clean water service provider may be able to provide some or all of that um, local match, uh, again, depending on the project or projects that are, are being pursued. Um, several different uh, eligible project types, uh, including um, and probably of, of primary interest to the, the town is really scoping for specific structures or areas with flood vulnerability. So you could use this um, uh, brick monies to study a, a single bridge um, or look at uh, stormwater needs uh, uh, writ large across the entire community. So um, lots of options for the, the scale of analysis that, uh, that could be conducted through this um, program. Now, in my uh, conversations with, um, with Stephanie, she suggested that if the uh, if the town wanted to pursue stormwater master planning monies through uh, one of the DEC programs currently that this was probably the better fit and that uh, as long as we package that proposal um, or couch that proposal in the language of flood resilience, that it's likely that we could um, access some of the, the funding here. Uh, the downside of this, um, if we look at the, the last line on the slide here, application deadline, uh, January 12th. So that application deadline is at the uh, the end of the week. Um, so that's, you know, maybe a bit more compressed of a timeline than, uh, than we're necessarily thinking about um, on the downside. But uh, on the plus side, note that this is an annual um, allocation of funds. And if for some reason, other funding opportunities didn't pan out favorably for the, the work that lies ahead, um, we could certainly um, make sure that we're well positioned to apply for uh, BRIC monies uh, in the uh, beginning um, weeks of uh, 2025. So the last uh, of these funding opportunities, as I mentioned, is the Clean Water Service Provider Program. Um, the State Department of Environmental Conservation administers the uh, Clean Water Fund. And um, as part of that, uh, the, the legislature passed a Clean Water Act uh, in recent years. And one of the things that that did was to establish these clean water service providers for each of the, the basins that drain into Lake Champlain. And there's a lot longer history about this that I, I won't totally go through, but um, essentially we're, we're tasked with um, cleaning up our, our phosphorus loads going into the lake. So, I mentioned before that um, this funding resource might not necessarily be the, the best place to, to shop for funds um, because uh, the projects that we're talking about here must be non-regulatory, so not required by a permit. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't require permits for implementation, but I'm talking about uh, required by a permit like a, a three-acre permit, for example. Um, 
with a primary goal of phosphorus reduction. So I know that you know the the conversation tonight is really centered around um, uh, enhancing or improving flood resilience. Um, so that puts uh, uh, some pretty heavy guardrails on the types of projects that um, might align with the uh, formula grant funds. So really what we're talking about here for ideal project types are going to be things like a floodplain or stream restoration, uh, developing river corridor easements, implementing riparian buffer plantings, and potentially uh, performing operations and maintenance on existing stormwater projects. And so this last one uh, is still sort of a work in progress at DEC, but um, as the clean water service provider, I can uh, quote unquote adopt an orphan project. So think about a stormwater project that was implemented, but um, the the catch basin's never been cleaned out. Um, you know the the stone line drainage ditch is now uh, overgrown and, and filled in with sediment. So we can expend some formula grant monies to uh, maintain the operation of these uh, different uh, stormwater pieces of stormwater infrastructure as long as there is a phosphorus credit that can be claimed uh, in relation to that, that work. Um, on the plus side, uh, I'm soliciting projects at least four times and sometimes up to six times uh, per year, and I have a budget of uh, about $875,000 to do project implementation. Now, um, that all sounds great, but I, I just wanna bring us back to this primary goal of phosphorus reduction. So in my conversations with, with Tom, um, you know, I certainly know that uh, floodplain reconnection is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a type of project that, uh, that Tom emphasized through our, our conversation. And so maybe there are some projects that are, you know, one-off projects that are really a, a good fit. Um, and, you know, the other nice thing about this is that, uh, the municipality can apply for this uh, directly um, with or without the, the assistance of the, the Regional Planning Commission. So um, the last thing I, I will say about this, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we can use some of our budget as matching funds. So I could potentially, um, you know, if we advanced a project and it was to a, a place where we were gonna award funds uh, for said project, we could use some of those project monies to serve as a match for federal money. So there's this potential, uh, thinking back to the hazard mitigation grant program, the, the first funding opportunity that I talked about, if there was, um, for example, a, uh, you know, a floodplain reconnection project that really rises to the, the top of the list of priorities for the, the town, um, Typically, those types of projects also convey a fairly significant phosphorus reduction benefit, um, and you know, thereby implying that it's a it's a good fit for the the program itself. So, um, you know, again, I'm not I'm not ruling anything out, and I don't want you to either. Uh, I just want to to make sure that folks are aware when they they see a, a big dollar amount, oh, a million dollars per year. Um, you know, yes, it is a lot of money, but there are some fairly stringent uh, guardrails that have been placed on that money that uh, I'm happy to work with the town to continue to explore looking for projects that that do fit well under this uh, current funding um, uh, regime. And then lastly, just want to talk about some some next steps. Um, as as I mentioned, I've, I've had a few conversations with Tom. I I have uh, um, at least a limited understanding of the, the priorities that have already been identified, but would certainly like to hear about other uh, project types and other work that uh, the town hopes to uh, engage um, over the, the coming months and years. Um, I'd be happy to talk about how CVRPC could help with uh, broader municipal engagement and outreach. Uh, up to and including engagement with um, uh, landowners, um, be they uh, the state or private property owners. And then lastly, um, really want to emphasize that uh, the Regional Planning Commission is here to help you um, both identify funding resources, but also to pursue those funding opportunities. So um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out if um, some technical assistance, grant writing assistance is something that you think that the, uh, the town could benefit from. 
So with that, uh, I'll stop talking. I'm happy to answer questions, um, but would also love to hear your thoughts on what you've heard tonight, uh, the kinds of projects that you really want to prioritize, and uh, really where we go from here. All right, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, great uh, overview of uh, some options open to us. Um, any uh, immediate questions? Fine. Brian, all of those funding levels are statewide, and how competitive are they between the states? Or and is there any priority given to different municipalities? Yeah, so a, a couple of things here. The the formula grant money, that budget that I, I showed on the formula grant slide, this is for work only in the Winooski River Basin. So, I mean, there are 50 or so municipalities. There are plenty of uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, natural resource conservation districts, watershed organizations, et cetera, that are, are competing for um, those funds. Now, that said, I've... Um, got a fairly significant amount of money left over from FY23 and haven't spent any of my FY24 money yet. So we are particularly flush at this point uh, with money um, through the clean water service provider. So if we can identify a good project that meets this non-regulatory phosphorus reduction target that, um, that we're talking about, um, I think that there's a, a really high likelihood that the, the town could access some of these funds. The Hazard mitigation grant program funds, those are the ones that only come out um, following a, a disaster, a declared disaster. Um, you know, my recommendation would be at a minimum, we find one or two projects and pursue funding through that program. That money is only available, you know, following a disaster. Um, there is a lot of money available, and uh, sometimes that uh, money gets sort of lost in the shuffle, you know, with all of the other things going on post-disaster recovery-wise. Um, you know, it's my understanding that there are times when that money doesn't get all the way drawn down. So I think going after some of that uh, hazard mitigation grant program money does make sense, uh, even even given the the relatively short timeline with a, a proposal scoping proposals due by the the end of this month. Um, the the brick money, that building resilient uh, infrastructure and communities money, that's um, probably going to be the the most competitive. Um, that said, if we were looking to the brick program to fund a, a stormwater master plan, we're not asking for a ton of money, um, and that could make it a an appealing project for uh, the the funding decision makers. Um, from that perspective, because we're not, we're not asking for, or we wouldn't be asking for anything close to the two million dollar allocation. Again, uh, thinking on the order of you know fifty thousand dollars, where if uh, the municipal match, the local match uh, is twenty five percent, you know that means your your federal request would be in the the order of thirty five or so thousand dollars. So out of a two million dollar tranche of funds, um, I I think it's you know, there is potential there to, to access that. If you were trying to pursue a bigger project with the BRIC funds, I think that, um, you know, we'd have to make a really compelling case for why why the town of Waterbury feels like they deserve the lion's share of the, the funds for a, a particular year. Um, uh, yeah, Danny. Um, I was curious if Tom, if you and Brian had talked about potential projects for, particularly for the hazard mitigation program. <clears throat> yeah, we talked about Winooski <clears throat> Street. Um, we talked about uh, the culvert project, potentially some work at the sort of land. And you feel like that's pretty reasonable to get um, the proposal in this month? I'm sorry, was that, was that a question for me? I didn't totally hear that. No, thanks, Brian. Sorry, I'll speak up, but uh, Tom answered that one. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the the deadline, um, I can I I can help uh, work on the the proposal, and then also the um, our emergency manager Keith Cubbin, who's working on the local hazard mitigation um, plan for the the town. He would also be available uh, to put some staff time towards that, so that we could um, develop the the most compelling uh, proposal possible.
Uh, Brian, I would expect that uh, the um, master planning uh, has been done for several different towns and that uh, the template for developing a proposal for that funding uh, would be uh, fairly well established? Yeah, I would have to look back at, um, you know, we haven't done any stormwater master plan since I've been here. I, I have engaged, I was on the planning commission in the town of Waitsfield for a long time and, and actually was involved in the planning commission when the CDRPC did the stormwater master plan for um, for the Matter River Valley. So I've actually been involved in the, the process. Um, the, you know, the proposal piece for that, uh, not overly difficult. Um, you know, they're basically looking for an identification of um, who the, the project partners, the project team would be, and then, uh, you know, some details about the, the area of interest, which I'm, I'm inferring, but certainly correct me if I'm wrong, would be the uh, the entire town um, as opposed to just the, the downtown. Either way is fine. Um, we just need to be real specific about what we're looking to analyze as part of that planning process. Okay. And then uh, are you familiar with the McBroom study uh, that identified uh, larger mitigation uh, initiatives? that was uh, developed in 2013? I am, yes. And uh, I, I, will, I, I can't say that I've read it cover to cover and, and certainly don't have it committed to memory, but I, I do know of that that work and it would certainly be um, you know worth digging into more. more. Mm -hmm. uh, based on what you did see, uh, would any of those be a good fit for the hazard mitigation grant program? I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I, I can't tell you a specific project off the, the top of my head, but I could certainly look back at that resource and flag those that uh, I think would be the best fit as one of my next steps coming out of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I recollect, uh, there were three uh, preferred alternatives that came out of that. One was the uh, Harvey Farm over in... Um, in Duxbury, uh, which uh, if the landowners uh, decide that they are not interested in working with us may not be feasible, uh, at least initially. Um, another would, was the um, excavating of a portion of the state-owned cornfield. Um, and then uh, a third was the uh, reconnection of floodplain uh, uh, just opposite the town, uh, the state complex in Winooski, I mean in um, Duxbury. Yeah, I, I think the, um, you know, given the, the questions about uh, the landowner for the, the first project, uh, I, I don't think that's ripe for proposal at this time, but I do think that the uh, the second two would be priority projects that, that we could and probably should pursue funding through this program for. Okay. And this is a case, you know, again, where we're talking about these floodplain reconnections, um, that those are the kinds of projects that convey a, a fairly significant phosphorus reduction benefit. And that really helps to support and justify the expenditure of the, the formula grant funds through the clean water service provider to, um, to help facilitate that project. And so we can do this, um, you know, we can think strategically about how we might mix and match the funds to make them, them go the, the furthest. I can tell you that um, I'm doing a, working on a project in Marshfield currently uh, a berm removal project along the main stem of the, the Winooski River. And uh, my target for the year is a 70 kilogram, uh, 140 or so pounds, 150 pounds of, of phosphorus reduction per year. That one project, that one berm removal project, if we get it all the way through implementation, uh, represents um, almost two years of the, the phosphorus target for me. So when I hear about uh, places that are interested in these floodplain reconnection projects, um, those are the ones that seem really attractive that I think we could shepherd through the, 
uh, the funding request process, uh, even if it means trying to tap funds from multiple different sources. Mm -hmm. Bill. Yeah, my only question, Roger, I, I know Brian is with the Regional Planning Commission. The cornfield certainly is in Waterbury. The one across the river is Duxbury. So would Duxbury have to apply for that? Are you, uh, is Waterbury eligible to apply for the ones across the river? Did you hear that, Brian? Uh, not really. I, I, I heard that it's had something to do with two different towns, but I'm not exactly sure what, what the issue was. was yeah, Bill was just asking, uh, the cornfield does lie within the town of Waterbury, uh, although it's state-owned. Uh, the, uh, the floodplain reconnection opposite the uh, state complex is in the town of uh, Duxbury, and he's wondering if Duxbury would have to apply for those funds or whether the town of Waterbury could apply for that project, even though the project would take place within the town of Duxbury. That is state-owned land though, correct? Yes, right. it is. Yeah, so really as long as we engage the state and the state is a willing partner, um, ideally we would involve Duxbury in the in the conversation, but it's not really incumbent on Duxbury to apply for the, the funding. It, it, it's, it'd be a, a little bit of a, a unique case, I suppose, but um, Certainly engaging Duxbury through the process um, should help alleviate any any concerns. And at the end of the day, if we're talking about state property, assuming that the state is on board with the, the effort, um, in, in some ways, it, it doesn't necessarily matter what the, the town thinks. Good. Um, <laughs> and, and let me just, I, I know this is being recorded and put on TV, so let me just say I'm not advocating that Waterbury start making decisions for the town of Duxbury. Um, but I, I am falling back on this. It is uh, state owned uh, land. And if the landowner is willing to engage the process, I don't necessarily know why it would matter if it was Waterbury or Duxbury that applied. It might strengthen the application if we get a letter of support from Duxbury or if Duxbury were to actually sign on to that part of the, the project. Yeah, and I think that's what Bill was just suggesting is that uh, we could strengthen our uh, proposal by having a consortium of two towns uh, on this initiative. Um, do you know uh, who represents the state in terms of uh, uh, whom we would approach within the state about the uh, project, the, the two projects, uh, Cornfield and the uh, project uh, across the river. Jennifer Finch, uh, she's the head of building general services. Yes. Jennifer Finch, okay. Cool. Well, it appears like we're making some progress. Um, I've been doing a lot of talking. Who else uh, has a question? Here's a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Let me try to read this. Uh, for the clean water service provider funding, is flood hazard mitigation identified as a co-benefit for the project? In other words, do projects that both reduce phosphorus and improve flood resiliency uh, be scored well? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, but it's really incumbent on the, um, the phosphorus reduction piece. So I mentioned before my target of uh, 70 kilograms per year phosphorus reduction. If you look at the, the overall budget, that means I've got about $15,000 per, per kilogram um, of, of phosphorus removed. So as long as the project being proposed um, yields a phosphorus reduction benefit that is on the order of 15 or so thousand dollars per kilogram, then the project itself looks attractive from a funding perspective. The flood mitigation co-benefit does earn a project proposal additional points, um, but the way that our scoring works for the proposals that we review under this program, if the phosphorus reduction isn't significant and also meeting that, that cost constraint, it's really unlikely that the project would get funded regardless of the number of co-benefits that, uh, that exist. And I know that's disappointing to some uh, or many of our partners. It's different than the way DEC has operated funding for this type of work in the past, um, but the Clean Water Service Provider is specifically tasked with 
phosphorus reduction. And if other good things happen, that's great, but um, certainly not the focus of the of the money uh, for that program. Mm -hmm. I read this morning that uh, the cities of Barrie and Montpelier are looking at flood proofing. Um, yeah, I would assume that means or could involve uh, the construction of berms. Um, are they looking at these same funds or are you familiar with uh, those initiatives? You know, I, um, I have been involved in some conversations, particularly with some of the um, House and, and Senate members. Uh, they, they uh, from Barrie, Barrie, Barrie Town, Barrie City and in Montpelier that are responsible for the, the recent omnibus package that was put before the, the state legislature. Um, part of that work, if it were to be funded, and I know there's a couple of different um, groups that are, are doing some work on this, and, and I'm not sure if, if Chris Kaliba is involved from the, the UVM side uh, in a, a parallel effort here, but, um, you know, Part of that omnibus package, if it were to pass, uh, would fund a, a flood study that um, would really help us identify the most vulnerable locations within the, the drainage basin, within the Winooski River Basin, um, and help set priorities on a, a more regional basis. Um, I'm not aware of either Montpelier or um, Barry City looking at the hazard mitigation grant uh, program funds or the BRIC uh, funds for that matter um, to do any work just yet. And they definitely have not applied for money through the clean water service provider for this work. I would be surprised um, if berms were the way, I, I, you know, we can't universally say no more berms, um, but I would be surprised if berms rise to the top of priority projects, given that we're actually trying to take berms out in, in many other locations. Right, yeah, bit of a concept there. Uh, other questions, Chris? Sure, do I need to come up or can he hear me? Uh, step forward, because it helps uh, you get the microphone right there. Thanks. Uh, Brian, for a long time I've been advocating for uh, a problem that I see as being a huge impact into our stormwater environmental issues, which is trying to uh, reduce uh, the amount of sand and salt use throughout the state. Uh, most towns put up three to 5,000 cubic yards a year. Uh, they go through a large portion of that. Uh, most of it ends up in our brooks and streams. Um, I don't know how this uh, how, how your department, um, if it's even on the radar, number one, number two, how would it address it? If there, are there any avenues to address it? Um, you know, just where I live on Neyland Flats, it's probably a two mile stretch of road, um, pretty flat most of the way. There's a short incline up by the town shed, but uh, we cross five bridges. If the road's so close to the brook, we cross five bridges there and it's exclusively used, salt is used to clear the road. Um, so it, it doesn't have a long ways to travel to get right into the water stream. Uh, second question is, and kind of encompasses the salt and sand use, that you mentioned dam removal. Uh, I know on Cobyville they removed one or two dams there in the last couple of years. And what I've witnessed is uh, huge amounts of sediment have been eroded from the last few streams that has caused huge embankments uh, where, the, where the brook has, during high water uh, problems, it has cut you know, huge amounts of silt down through uh, that section of brook uh, and all the way up through to by my house. And I'm curious to know, what the impacts of that are on the, the lower tributaries, Winooski and even the Lake Champlain. Uh, and then the last thing pertains to the mitigation study done on the Duxbury side of the river back after Irene. Um, there was a project, two duplexes that were built just down here on the Bolton Road, just outside of town below the uh, dam. Um, the exit of the dam river that flows into the Winooski. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming and quite sure, because I spoke to an engineer just 
two days ago about it, that those projects, the two brand new duplexes, had to meet new floodplain criteria uh, as far as elevations of first floor. Um, both those units have been flooded twice during the last two storms to the uh, extent of two to two and a half feet of water in the lower units. Um, and I, I guess my question to you, Tom, was when that last storm hit, or the last two storms, was the dam still uh, operating under some capacity, releasing water, and had it been able to shut the water completely off, would that have prevented those those apartment complexes from being water, flooded? Water bear reservoir? Yeah. I, I, everything they did is documented. What I can tell you is um, they followed their protocol and they closed the floodgates, not just on the reservoir, but all the dams, all the flood safety dams upstream of us. And at no point um, did water flow over the floodgates or did they have to open the floodgates because of capacity issues. Several days after the flood proceeded, they opened their gates in a major way to get themselves additional storage to be prepared for the next event. But my understanding is, in short, the, the dams did their job, 100%. They don't, they don't shut off the flow. A little river doesn't stop running. Yeah. They don't pull everything back. Yeah. Well, see, back when we were looking at the, the new flood elevations, uh, the consensus was to go at, a, I believe, 101 foot elevation for new structures, for first floor structures. Mm -hmm. I proposed 104 feet. Uh, and there were some other people on the Planning Commission that were on board with that too, but we settled on 101 and consequently those two new apartments got flooded because of it. Not to say that, you know, I, and I was wondering what could have taken place that might have prevented that. And if I recall that, that mitigation study, uh, 300,000 cubic yards, I believe, at a cost of $7 million dollars only lowered the water level a foot from from the Irene flood. So uh, I think it's going to take more than more than that. Uh, it's a good start, but I think you know moving forward, uh, I think we're seeing worse consequences from the storms and wondering how 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 effective something like that would be. So thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Brian, do you want to address uh, any of the three questions that, uh, that Chris had? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first question about uh, salt use on the roads, uh, the Lake Champlain Sea Grant recently had a, a workshop and Chris uh, Stepanek is, uh, I think, leading this effort here um, at, the, at the Lake Champlain Sea Grant, but basically looking at salt application and alternatives to salt. And so you might have seen in the, the last few weeks or so uh, a story or or two about using brine on on roads as uh, opposed to salt. Um, you know that is really a decision to be made by the the select board and the and the road uh, department. Um, the the RPC does not dictate or govern what what uh, the way that the individual roads are managed within the municipality. Um, that said, you know there are this effort, there is this effort through the, the Lake Champlain Sea Grant. There's uh, a Better Backroads um, grant funding as well as a, as this um, research effort out of uh, out of UVM and the, the Sea Grant. And really, you know, the um, it's not that the technology is super advanced, but it does cost money. And it's a different piece of equipment that would be used to spread brine and even to create the brine. Um, than what exists for all of the the trucks that are outfitted currently that are that are spreading sand. Um, you know, 25 years ago, I moved here from the the Pacific Northwest. They stopped using sand. Uh, I'm sorry, salt on many of the roads, at least on the west side of the uh, the Cascade Range, because they were concerned about the impacts to to salmon. Um, obviously, winter looks a little bit different over there, but um, you know they've dialed it in pretty well. So it, it's certainly something that can be done. Um, but it is a pretty big change of mindset and uh, from the way that roads are are currently managed. Um, I can certainly have our transportation planner uh, reach out and uh, talk more to um, the select board and or the the town road crew if that's uh, something that folks are are interested in in advancing. Um, 
second question was about the the dam removal um, and what sounds like some scouring following the the removal of some some small dams. I need to get a little more detail um, on the the dam specifically so that I could do some research on, you know, when was the when were those dams removed? Um, who was the the project sponsor? And um, you know, make a, a connection with. Um, you know the the project sponsor, as well as um, maybe connect with some some uh, DEC staff, the river scientists, for example, to go out into the field and, and take a look. And it's potential for a project like that, where um, what's known as a strategic woody addition. So basically, dropping um, logs or other large uh, chunks of wood into a stream, anchoring them. Um, slowing down that water and thereby reducing the potential for scour during the high flow events. So um, there are, you know, there are some options, um, but I think I'd need to get a little more detail before I want to to dig in uh, too too much on that. And I'm happy to follow up with uh, with you on that, Chris. And then the the last um, piece was a question about um, floodplains and and new development. Um, I'm not sure how new uh, the new development, the the duplexes um, are that you're talking about, but we're currently um, engaged in a process with FEMA where they're updating all of our flood insurance rate maps. And as part of that, they're going to um, uh, delineate new uh, flood hazard areas. And uh, my understanding is that for Washington County, um, we are looking at uh, a preliminary data release, hopefully sometime in 2024. The, the date has been shifting uh, backwards a little bit, but I, I've been led to believe that it, it should be summer 2024, but um, also don't have any control over when those maps uh, themselves are released. I My expectation based on your description of the property would be that um, you know the the recently constructed duplexes are likely to fall inside the new designation for that that flood hazard area, and um, we're working <clears throat> right now on some evaluations of town plans and zoning bylaws to assess whether or not they conform with the the model language that's already been approved by FEMA. And we'll be conducting outreach over the course of this next year to engage the uh, planning and conservation commissions, particularly about updating um, flood hazard regs uh, in the in the towns. Doesn't do much for the structures that are already there, but hopefully will get us to a place where we can avoid uh, these kinds of repeat losses for future development. Yeah, no. Yeah, just a couple of points. Uh, first, the uh, the second point, Brian, the dam in Colbyville uh, was not a dam removal; it was a dam failure. Um, no one, somebody owns that dam, but it hasn't been maintained or um, actively looked at at all. Uh, two winters ago, or two springs ago now, uh, a small hole. Uh, came into the dam and now the hole is bigger. Uh, DEC was notified of it when it happened. Uh, so that, there's nobody to find uh, who removed that dam. It's, it's simply a, uh, a failure and it, I looked at the hole the other day and it's, it's bigger than it was a year ago. So I expect there'll continue to be some degradation there. Uh, your point about woody debris, uh, you know, putting wood into the stream. We did that in the lower portion of um, Thatcher Brook down below the um, grist mill probably 15 or 20 years ago to try to stabilize the bank where the kids uh, cross-country ski down below the school. Uh, the village or EFUD has a sewer line that goes across that field and it's important that that be stabilized so rip -rap in there too. yeah there was riprap and there was uh, you know some uh, kind of experimental programs in terms of driving uh, tree trunks and the like into the into the bank uh, so that might be something that can be done there I came up here I, I don't think Chris really meant to imply that um, you know a foot 
of uh, flood reduction isn't important. Um, you know, $7 million to reduce um, the flooding by a foot. Even, in, even in, in Irene, somebody was flooded that wouldn't have been flooded if it had been a foot lower. And in July and in December, uh, I think if we had that extra foot of capacity, there'd be a lot happier people around. And $7 million sounds like a lot of money, but it's three times that we've had that flood since 2011, and it's probably going to be, I hope not, but more frequent. Uh, so anything that we can do to, to lower the, the flood elevation is important. In those buildings that Chris talked about, I remember the whole discussion about uh, 101 or 104. Um, probably it would have been good in those days if we had said, you know, if there's nothing in the floodplain, you just can't build in it, as opposed to deciding to raise uh, the elevation of the first floor and, and, you know, it displaces water and everything else. But uh, that's, a, that's a different issue. But I did want you to know that the dam was not a removal, it was a, a failure, and uh, reducing the elevation by eight inches of, or a foot, whatever we can do to make the flood elevation go down, I think it's um, uh, the cost benefit over the course of time will, will be worthwhile. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Bill, and um, maybe Tom knows the answer to this, but ha has anyone from Dam Safety been out to look at this following any of these events? Uh, if so, no one's notified us. Dam Safety. Okay. Um, Dam Safety. I can, I can reach out to, uh, to some folks over there, see if it's on their radar, and if not, um, try to get it on their radar to go out and, and look um, at that and see what, uh, if anything, could, could be done there. Uh, Bill just mentioned that dam safety was notified. Uh, yeah, when it happened, first all was beer. It, when it happened in 2021, I think it was, um, mm -hmm. we we notified them. They they looked at it. There's there's no report here um, that I'm aware of. Somebody got their hand up. No, Catherine, who only is identified as Catherine's, Catherine's iPad, iPad. Mm -hmm. says October 17, 2021, dam release in morning in Kobeville. Yes, dam safety has been out. Catherine, do you wish to speak to your comments? It's only Catherine's iPad, maybe. So. Uh, oh, hi. Oh, Woody's at home on Kate's iPad. Hi, Woody. <laughs> Woody? He says no. He's on an iPad. So oh, so he's not on an iPad. Tricky. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, well, Woody. We do have an update. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Great. Uh, Tom, you've been having conversations uh, with Brian about the priorities, and I want to get to the next steps because we're running out of time for what we allocated. Uh, in terms of near-term priorities, what uh, what are you what have you been discussing? Um, potentially some flood hardening at the sewer plant. Uh, the water infrastructure seems fine. We've been discussing Winooski Street and discussing. Uh, there's also a sewer line um, down here that's exposed and, and potentially protecting that. Um, we've been discussing the Greg Hill culvert and potentially a couple of other ones. Um, and then some, some conversations about the cornfield, the state complex, and across the river. Mm -hmm. Those are really the big projects. Not on Brian's list, but we actually, it's in our, um, it's in our to-do list to go um, visit a couple of facilities that use brine. The state has uh -huh. um, facilities, and I think Morris, either Morristown or Morrisville has one. So I think we go there at some point this winter and bend their rear. But it's, it's a likely six-figure investment to convert entirely to brine. Right, you have to convert all our uh, trucks, right? And we are reducing salt use on a number of streets already on an experimental basis. Um, yeah, can I, I do think if we're compiling a list of projects that might be eligible, the culverts are acceptable. As Chris pointed out, we go over five bridges climbing that road, um, and we saw in December um, areas that flooded that weren't flooded in Irene and weren't flooded in July. Um, so I think 
having water in places where there shouldn't be water, especially up there, was a great concern to a lot of people. And I know some of those culverts are probably smaller than they need to be at this point. Yeah, we can look at those. Um, challenges, none of them failed in the end. And when it comes to, um, yeah, our focus is going to be on the art of the possible here for the first round. Um, and, you know, bridge work we can do, but all the bridges were inspected by engineers and they came through the floods fine. Um, the flooding on private land is a private land issue at this stage. We haven't engaged with them yet. Sure. So yeah, I think it's probably a, I think there's probably some projects here, but it may not be a 2024, maybe the next round of funding later in this year or next year. Yeah, well, listen. Brian, have towns used municipal planning grants or other resources, particularly for the master planning for stormwater? Not that I'm aware of, no. I, I don't, um, my recollection is that I've never seen that kind of work prioritized by um, ACCD for the municipal planning grants. It's more like update your flood bylaws or update your village master plan, um, but I've not seen anything specifically targeted towards stormwater master planning with those funds. Thank you. I mean, we could certainly ask, the worst they could say is no, and then we're in the same place we are. And I'm I'm happy to reach out to um, the crew at ACCD to ask that question, but my suspicion is the answer is no, that there's other funds um, that they would prefer that we pursue for that purpose. Yes, Mike. Uh, Brian, as kind of it's been said a little bit here, flooding events, phosphorus, siltation, sediment, they all don't respect political boundaries. Um, it, it's, it's a basin-wide program. And a lot of your, the proposed proposals for hazard mitigation plans, et cetera, are on a town by town basis. Is there any move to convert to more of a basin type planning to attack all of these issues? Because if we don't, some of the towns may be passing some of their problems onto other towns. Well, I think some towns are already passing their problems onto other towns as it relates to, to water for sure. Um, have I seen any move towards that? Um, yes and no. I, yes, from the perspective of um, river corridor management. Um, so one of, I think it was Bill that that mentioned this earlier, or maybe at least think about uh, this, that, you know, this thought that you had, if there's not already development in the, the floodplain, then let's not let it, uh, let's not permit develop, new development there. You know, with the uh, river corridor management um, pursuit by by DEC, they're looking really at uh, no adverse impact. So basically, not permitting structures closer to uh, the floodplain than than already exist. So um, not allowing that type of encroachment to occur. I you know I feel like the state is beginning to acknowledge the need for a, a larger role, at least in the the river corridors as they present themselves what that means for local planning and decision making, I'm not quite sure yet because I don't think that uh, idea has been um, been fully fleshed out. I, I, I mean, I think you're, you're spot on. It, it's, you know, the issue is it, it really kind of conflicts with uh, the history of local land use decision making in the state. And so when you start talking about giving up some of that authority at the, the local level, there is uh, almost certainly going to be some some pushback, even though um, I would agree from a um, from a hydrology or ecology standpoint, managing some of these critical resources at something other than a political boundary definitely makes more sense. I think that I think the legislature is going to have a heavy session of discussion related to um, flood hazard mitigation. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of that um, and really hoping that the release of the new um, flood maps from FEMA will help us guide that conversation in a way that's, that's constructive and yields the results that we all really wanna see. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Brian, um, given the, the tight deadline for the BRIC funding, um, would it make any sense for us to try to scramble and get in a proposal for a uh, master plan um, uh, before Friday or by Friday? Or should we, would, would it make more sense to just wait until FEMA's done its work and uh, wait for next year? Let me look at the the application in more detail, and I can I can let Tom know uh, tomorrow morning if I, I think that's something we should pursue. I, my inclination is to say that we should probably wait for next year, um, but if the application does not seem too onerous, we might be able to pull something together in in time. The, okay. the you know the question there would be um, whether or not the the town has matching funds available at this time, or if um, we'd have to seek other funds for matching, or if you would, um, and I'm not sure where you're at in your budgeting process, um, whether there's still time to include matching funds as part of the um, next year's budget. We can figure out the matching funds fees. Yeah, we're still in the budgeting process and will be until the end of the month. Uh, so we can, we can figure that one out. Uh, that shouldn't be an obstacle, especially okay. for... $15,000, something like that. Um, Chris. Yeah, one last question, Brian. Um, but I, I, I agree with Bill that, you know, any any help to lower the flood level is a, is a benefit. Uh, the $7 million price tag was a decade ago. Um, do your programs have the capability of putting that type of funding forward for projects such as that? Wasn't wasn't seven million, Chris? Um, three. Are you sure? I think it was two point eight or three rings of yeah. bell. But it's probably seven today. Yeah. So um, you know, the short answer is no. But um, the hazard mitigation grant program, as I, as I mentioned, you know, that's a, a pretty big pool of funds, and so that might be an area to try to tap for a, a project of that magnitude. The other piece um, to mention is that we could continue this dialogue with the um, emergency management and try to assess whether a proposal like this might actually represent a project of national significance where we could go for money in excess of that $2 million, basically competing at the national level to see if uh, a project of this nature might be interesting enough as a, a proof of concept, for example, to tap into a, a larger bank account and, um, you know, implement the project and use that as a as sort of a, a benchmark for other communities facing similar types of issues. I mean, I, it's not, certainly not guaranteed. Um, the provision is there for these projects of national significance, but again, without knowing the the set criteria for what that actually looks like i I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say that that would be a good uh, a good avenue for sure okay what what if for example the whole basin went in on together Barry Montpelier Waterbury Richmond what if we all went in on a project together to apply for that federal grant do you think that would be an avenue we could pursue I think if we made the connection between upstream and downstream communities and had support from downstream communities that that takes us certainly down the the path of generating more compelling project idea than simply um the town itself proposing a project for seven million dollars with uh, the potential to benefit uh, downstream neighbors without without collaboration so i think if you could bring more partners to the the table um, or and or get um, supporting documentation from other um, other municipalities in this case that it does make the the proposal stronger whether that meets that yet to be determined threshold of a project of national significance I don't know but you're 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 thinking along the right lines in in my estimation and when I was speaking with the um, the legislators from from uh, Barry City, Barry Town, and, and Montpelier, you know, my message to them was really, you know, it's great that the the three of you are working together, but what I'd really like to see is that you reach out to, um, you know, the reps for 
uh, even the municipalities in Chittenden County. Um, because if we can get Chittenden County on board and supporting projects like this, uh, little old Washington County might seem a lot more important at that point. And, um, you know, mitigating the issues uh, in our county before they get to Chittenden County certainly seems like the uh, the right way to go. And, you know, that might um, include even, uh, you know, more wild ideas like having uh, other, you know, downstream communities help facilitate, um, you know, potentially matching funds for a project of that magnitude. You know, they're still going to derive some benefit, even if the project isn't uh, constructed or implemented within their within their county boundaries. challenge you have right now, Kane, is um, most, most communities that work at hard don't know what their plan B is as yet. They're still figuring that out. They have not a lot of time to do that because they're still figuring out the FEMA claim right. from the first flood. The other piece is um, after the flood, my sense from talking with folks at the state was they were really interested in projects that would reduce the impact of future flood and more floods like lowering the floodplain areas, reconnecting floodplains, more so than flood hardening. And and since then, it sounds like their thinking has shifted. And even the state of the state last week, I really got that sense that there's less interest in those sort of projects and more more interest in just acknowledging floods are going to be here. Let's harden, but it's cheaper to cheaper to do that than to reconnect floodplain and do some of those other projects. It's hmm. just a sense I have. It could be entirely wrong. Sure. All right, uh, Brian, thank you so much for taking all this time with us. Uh, I realize we've gotten a bit over time, uh, but uh, we really do appreciate your expertise and uh, you sharing it with us. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, you'll be back in touch with Tom uh, maybe as early as tomorrow about uh, the potential for the uh, master planning and then also uh, these uh, hazard mitigation uh, priorities uh, that, uh, that we're uh, taking under consideration. Yeah, great. Um, and I will, as I mentioned, share my presentation with Tom so he can share it out with you. And uh, for those of you that don't have my contact information, it's uh, included on the last slide of the, the slide deck. So look forward to continuing to work with you. And um, yeah, please just don't hesitate to let me know how we can help uh, moving forward. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. all. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just want to acknowledge Doug, who's our rep to CVRPC, who obviously provides this type of stuff on an ongoing service, but has been going to the monthly meetings. I took the minutes while we were sitting here, mm -hmm. so just to thank him, one of those folks we appointed a long time ago. And Doug, do you have anything to add to the conversation before we move on? Only that um, the Regional Planning Commission has been asked to assemble a sort of a list of ideas to be shared with a couple of legislators who are interested in the flooding issues that we're facing, and then we've been working on that internally, and that will go out. But I don't believe there's anything in it that hasn't been seen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think we've Mentioned a couple of uh, priorities here. Um, I think, uh, Tom, I don't know if you have a sense of how to move forward in the short term uh, with, uh, with Brian and uh, any ideas that we can share with Doug? I think in the short term, I, I've been focused on the hazard mitigation grants. Um, the brick is relatively new to me, and that's just sort of an example of the more asset funding out there where you've got to figure it out. Um, I think as a mitigation against our best approach from what I've been hearing. Mm -hmm. And for that, we would need to identify a uh, uh, number of priorities and then narrow them down uh, for uh, that 30% uh, engineering. Uh, yeah, in essence, you, you apply to the state. The state does the engineering, mm -hmm. pays for the engineering through the grant. And, and based on that, they do their own cost benefit analysis. And if it fundamentally makes sense to pay for the implementation, they'll help you with that. Okay. And we'll share that information with Doug so that you can coordinate with the, with the Central Vermont Regional Planning. Okay. There are no more questions on this. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is budget. the budget, uh, starting with the cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. But you can't see. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, Tom, if you wouldn't mind just leading us through the sure um, what's been prepared for the cemetery. Let me actually start with the expenses, um, and I'll get to the revenues because there's a couple um, couple updates. So, on the expense side, um, the, the there's regular pay and part time pay. Um, the regular pay is for um, some staff that do some work related to all the administrative work for cemeteries. Um, part-time pay is actually generally public works where they come in and do the grave openings. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought we, in 2023 we had some extra funds in there. We were looking to hire um, a very interesting job title, a cemetery sextant. So it still exists, but it's someone who in essence manages the administrative side of the work. Um, I've gotten quite an education in grave openings and related things. Um, put that, hit the pause button on that, um, done because it's a tighter budget this year. Mm-hmm. Um, challenge we had for cemeteries, there's, there's sort of two big numbers on the expenses. There's grounds maintenance um, and there's contractors. Um, we, we spent extra in 2023 in part because there was a donation received in a prior year to do some capital work, which was done. So the money came in a prior year, went out in 2023. Um, we also, for years, had a great deal uh, with a local guy who mowed Hope Cemetery for almost nothing. Um, he retired, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, we went out to market, and Woody got every bid he could, and the cheapest bid was um, two grand a week. He mow every week and trim, you know, trim every other. Um, we we have um, just recently um, we hired a uh, a member of the fire team who's gonna who's gonna mow and trim for us all summer. He's a retired individual, mm-hmm. um, and that should help control costs. And then there's a proposal to hire um, an individual that's been working for the water department and to make him in essence a third paid for by the town. Those costs are in public works, um, and that would help too. So I think in, in the net analysis the the fifty thousand dollars for contractors is probably going to be controlled, but we'll shift it to pay. So I think on a net we're going to save a little bit, but but I'm not super confident of that yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but the short way to think of it is that you know it, it's ninety grand or so to maintain your cemeteries, and there's no big major capital projects planned for next year. The good news is we've done a lot the last couple of years, um, so we should be able to maintain around that ninety thousand dollar level. Um, on the revenue side, what I showed on this street was sort of base revenues that we anticipate every year from things like lot sales and then grave openings, um, which are fairly minor. We, you know, the seminary commission is looking at some of the prices we charge, but there's not a lot of volume there. Um, you know, in general, people are cremated these days, and, and um, that's just the, the trend, uh, if you will. Uh, what I didn't show here, it is it is incorporated to the budget and sort of the summary pages, is the funds from the cemetery trust. It's timely because I met with the library earlier today to talk about funds from their trust. Um, for the last several years, the cemetery trust has given, um, sort of skimmed off the top, 25 grand. And the cemetery commissioners um, have agreed to increase that to 40 to offset the budget. So that's in there. So the way to think of the cemetery is, um, there's net revenues of about 57, and there's net expenditures of, of poking at 90. So you've got below $30,000 um, cost to the taxpayer at the end to run the cemeteries, mm-hmm. um, which is not incredibly high, but it's higher than it's been in future years. Future, in, sorry, it's higher than it's been in the past few years. In the past few years, the taxes we sent to the cemetery were fixed at 15,000, um, but in the end, that wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. So we were, were sort of catching up for the last couple of years. Um, and the seminary commissioners, just like the library commissioners, don't control your budget, but they have an element of control of the trust. So mm-hmm. they've agreed to that increase. Um, well, the will... $40,000 cut into the principal? <coughs> yeah. No. Yeah, there's about, four, there's about 400 grand there. So unless you're in 10%, it'll, it'll cut into the principal. No. So. 
Yeah, I apologize. I, I, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding, and I've had this conversation a couple of times with Tom. Um, unlike the library, the cemetery fund, Fund 53, has as an asset the money that's in the trust, the money that's held in the town's checking account, the other revenues come into that fund, and all the expenses for the cemetery are in that fund. So if you go back to the 2023 budget, the only interface between the cemetery fund and the general fund was the $15,000 uh, that top line, property taxes from the general fund. In the general fund budget, there was a $15,000 uh, appropriation made, and you can find that in the town report. And that $15,000 gets sent to the cemetery fund in 2023, and it happened. If you look down in the 2023 budget, Tom has a line that says from cemetery trust which is not in the budget for that was presented last year. There's a line that this line that Tom has for interest, 53600800100, that line was budgeted for $250 this, this, this year. And, um, you can see there's $1,572 of interest that's been posted to that line. That interest is the interest that is generated for the cemetery trust by money that's just in the town's checking account. And my presumption is that, the fifth, that there's 1572 there because I think earlier in the year you took $25,000 out of the investments and you put it in the general fund. But when you took the $25,000 out of the investments, it went from money that was invested in Fund 53, and now it shows up on the due to line in Fund 53. So it's still all in Fund 53. The $25,000 that Tom has on the line that says from Cemetery Trust, I have the, the budget here. That's interest on investments. Uh, last year we generated 17,462 and we had losses last year of almost $60,000 on another line that's not on Tom's budget for securities gains and losses. So that, that line that says from cemetery trust, you don't need to take money out of the cemetery trust to put into the general fund to pay for the cemeteries. The money is already in this fund. I don't know what the, the gain is going to be, but my, my guess is that on the interest line that Tom doesn't show, interest on investments, it's probably going to be above $10,000. And I'm pretty sure that there's going to be securities gains this year. So I think in your 2024 proposal, you should have something from the cemetery trust generating interest there. You don't have to take money out of the cemetery trust fund in order to pay for cemetery expenses. Um, as long as there's enough money in the general fund, you can just pay for it and, and the due to line changes. So, um, so this is accounting, uh, we, just have a fund. we just have a difference in accounting, but this isn't budgeting. Well, there should be 20, there should be something in the proposed 2024 budget. It's on a different page of the budget. For interest? Yeah. Can I sit next to you? It wasn't, it wasn't the interest, uh, just the way he's showing it here, this is from last week's packet. Overall, sorry, I was doing the same thing. Summary of all revenues. And then in this line, we have cemetery fund, which is doing 25, 25, 25, 25 budget and the proposed 40 for next year. But the 25,000 you're claiming, that's that's all from the interest. Yeah, but I'll, that was just reflected in a different right. line here. All I'm saying is you don't have to take money out of the cemetery fund. The cemetery commissioners don't have to say, sure, let's take $40,000 rather than 25. It's all in the fund. It's already an asset in the fund. So 
If you want to take money out of the investment portfolio uh, to earn less interest and to not be able to get uh, gains on it, that, that's fine. You just mm -hmm. don't need to do it in this fund. The library fund is different. The library fund has fund 16, which is a, the trust fund. Yeah. Money gets generated there, and it gets sent to the operating fund right. of the library. This is the operating fund for the cemetery. So you don't have to take money out of the trust unless there's not enough money in the general fund to pay for cemetery stuff. So in terms of budgeting, all I'm trying to say, and I apologize, mm -hmm. uh, is that I think there should be the line items that we proposed to the public last year should be shown to the public this year in terms of how they perform. And they probably, at least one of those lines, should have some revenue that's generated for the trust. The $25,000 I think that you have here, Tom, that you're showing from Cemetery Trust is the money that you took out of the investment portfolio. Yes, and I've changed the accounting for how we do cemeteries. OK, that's yeah. fine. So the, the accounting has been shifted. And that's the reason for the discrepancy. Okay. Uh, questions about uh, the presentation? I don't know if you're done. You're done. Uh, yeah, I'm done. Okay. Questions about the cemetery budget? Um, King. Yeah. Um, not to go too deep into the, um, the cemetery fund. Um, Just six feet. Just six Someone had to do that. I promised where you were going, but you wouldn't decide. But at some point, with the rate of people not being buried, right, um, eventually the fund runs out. Yeah. Right. Doesn't have I mean, to, it's not this year, it's not next year, but it, it, some, in some year the fund will It could be next year. So <laughs> it could be next year. The, the, way to, the way to think of it is... Um, for, for, forget if there was a if there was a trust or not. Ninety grand in expenses, twenty grand in revenue. So you've got a gap of seventy that falls to the taxpayers. Right. We skim money out of the trust to cover some of that gap. Um, it's no guarantee if the trust goes up or down, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to take money from the trust because if the cemetery commissioners who have amount to control over the trust, they see the monthly statements of the trust balances. So if we say to them, hey, there's 400 grand in the trust, um, but there's an accounting entry, so you really don't have that 400. It's invested on behalf of the town. That sort of gets lost in the wind, and they think, well, we got 400 grand. Um, I think if they make decisions to pull from the trust, we should pull from the trust, which is what they decided, um, similar to the library. Um, but yeah, and the, the library is different. The library is ongoing. The library is going to have ongoing capital needs. Um, you know, at some point there's going to be a, cap, a big capital project to, to redo the building. I know it's, it's new, but give it 20 years, right? Um, they'll pay their fair share of the heating system, which we're going through all sorts of machinations with. Cemeteries are really pure maintenance. Right. Uh, the maintenance is going to increase very slowly. So yeah, the future of the cemetery trust, it's probably gonna take many, many years, but there may not be a trust fund invested there. It depends on you know, the reasonable rate of, your, of return you expect there, but and also the reasonable rate, the reasonable tax increase rate you wanna have and how you wanna balance those two. Right. But in the end, it's, it's all a taxpayer cost in the end. Which is the direction I was going, um, since we are losing money and people are seemingly not choosing to be buried or receiving headstones as we go through the years. It's worth thinking about moving this out of this sort of budgetary discussion and maybe putting it to referendum at some point in the next 10 years on whether the town continues to maintain the cemeteries using the fund or using taxpayer dollars. Well, I mean, in the end, they're running the same. They're all sort of owned by the tax. Doesn't the, the town own the trust fund? The town owns the trust fund. The commissioners, it's, it's just like the library. The town owns the trust fund. It is indeed town dollars, but uh, the commissioners vote on the use of the fund. Right. right. 
and there's Kane, if you look at it, and if 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 I'm hearing what you're saying, if you use the trust fund to maintain the cemeteries, in the next five years, there's not going to be any money left in right. the how And then we're, it's just taxpayer dollars at that point. There is no right. And I, I think what you're trying to, you're trying to manage is the balance between those two over the long term. Right. So you don't want to, you know, I'll use the fiscal cliff analogy, you don't want to um, sort of have a shock to the budget all in one year. So if you, right. you want to sort of increase, I think, the cost of the taxpayer relatively slowly, which we're doing to the tune of about 15 grand. And then I hope, you know, we're going to work real hard again to hire for the summer, but I think the way to do it, um, I think we can maintain the cemeteries cheaper with our own part-time staff. It's been a struggle to find them of late. And it's funny because for for the first 20 years of my career, the mantra in, in, in state and local government was outsourcing. Um, now I think that um, coin has flipped a bit and we're trying to insource some of the work again. I think that's a better option. We've just got to find the people to do it. But we've got one guy who's happy to run a mower and a trimmer 40 hours a week all summer, and that's going to be a big help. Um, mm -hmm. And then if the um, if the select board and EFUD board agree to hire the employee we talked about, he'd be uh, he'd be available in the summer for a lot of that work too. Sure. That's not necessarily a, a savings because to some extent it frees up more experienced road crew to do road work. Or, um, the other piece to think about um, is that the budget and I didn't I, I, I tried to get there I just didn't have time and I didn't want to make too many changes from prior years, but. For at least several years, um, public works crew have done a fair amount of cemetery work already, so we're not reflecting their costs in the budget. So really, um, you know, Exception last year they did expense. they did all the mowing and trimming in Maple Street. What's that? What is that in terms of time? It's a pretty fair amount. Yeah, it's all, that's, it's all, right. all that's reflected in rec, um, yeah. in parks and rec. But they did all that work too. Oh. Yeah, in, in past years that money was accounted. The cemetery fund paid the highway fund for what the highway department did. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was on the grounds maintenance side. And that's, you can easily do that. And it was done uh, with, there's cross charges, or there used to be cross charges at least, mm -hmm. in, in every department. So in past years, what the highway crew did for the cemeteries was paid to the highways. And I think if you look at the 2023 budget, you'll see line items for revenue in the highway department and, and uh, expenses in other departments that paid those cross charges. And whether or not that was done this year, I don't know. But mm -hmm. uh, the cemetery fund, uh, I, I guess all I would ask is that the 23 budget, uh, for the purposes of reporting to the residents and taxpayers, should be shown as it was budgeted last year. So line items that are not on this sheet that were presented to the taxpayers should be on there. So you can see all of the revenue that went into the cemetery fund and all of the expenses that came out of the cemetery fund. If Tom wants to change how he accounts going forward, I have no problem with that. And, and you know, it's not an issue between Tom and me about 2024. But 2023 should be accounted for as it was presented to the voters. And right now, here it's not. Mm -hmm. Any comment, Tom? It's just a different part of the budget, just presenting it differently. Mm -hmm. I guess as I'm trying to consider this as a select board member, I'm asking if we're comfortable with the recommendation from the cemetery commissioners. I don't have a lot of experience in this. I know we have a tax stabilization fund that has a set policy. I know the library can't find the set policy. I don't want, know what policy the cemetery does or doesn't have. I might fundamentally disagree with Tom about like if it should spend it down or not, but I guess I feel like the question within our purview tonight, I just want to be careful about like what we can and can't adjudicate. I think that's a fair point. I have the town report out for next year. I think we can report in a parallel way for comparison as it's useful. The proposal I see is a $40,000 from this year. If the cemetery commissioners are comfortable with it, I'm not inclined to 
object to the recommendation, but is it a broader board policy about do they have a set policy? Do we have concerns about their set policy? Are we touching no more than 5% of the principal of the year? Like, I don't know, but I'm just trying to figure out how we um, yeah. just are respectful of everyone here tonight and adjudicate this and then also move forward with the other departments we have to review. <laughs> There's that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, that's really the question. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think uh, it feels just a, addressing an accounting issue. Uh, it's just asking that we show the uh, budget the way it was presented uh, to the taxpayers last year. Uh, the, the budget was presented to the taxpayers and we'd like to see reflected uh, in the report. Yeah. Can that be done in a narrative way? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel yeah. like addressing it, obviously there is a change in the structure to the budget. People might not know how to look for that or, or where to look. So. And this isn't the town report. This is... Oh, yeah. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. So perhaps no, 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 no. we just need to footnote this, uh, uh, and we could even add a line showing that the tra where the transfer was made. I guess I would say, like offhand, I have a moment of pause around like the idea of spending a trust down forever. I do recognize it's a vastly different operating model from the library, but I guess in my limited understanding, you know, taking a portion of the earnings every year. I'm just saying I don't. I have no problems with this year's presentation, but I guess that to me is the other footnote. Is if there's a the broader conversation, I think Kane's point may be a little aggressive because I think we're obligated to take the going out of business cemeteries, but it is like the longer term yeah. operational model about how we do it at what cost uh, is, yeah. you know, maybe worth revisiting outside of this year's budget. Yeah. Like, my, my understanding is that the reason we're in the cemetery business is that uh, they don't make money and so therefore it becomes the responsibility of the town. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a better than state law. One, one, final, one final point, and, and the reason why the $15,000 was in the general fund and showing the transfer into the cemetery fund was simply what we're talking about, is that it was to show the voters that the cemetery is owned by the town, that it's the town's obligation to maintain those cemeteries, and by raising $15,000 of taxes and putting it into Fund 53, the cemetery fund, mm -hmm. That's $15,000 that's going in, which doesn't have to come out of the trust, and you can leave that money invested, and it grows more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and I'm not telling you that you should budget $15,000 to, to send to the cemetery fund. I mean, Tom's got a tax rate that he's trying to meet. There's all kinds of different ways to do it, and I'm not suggesting that you've got to put money there, but the $15,000 going from the general fund was to show the public that there's an expense, a tax expense for the cemeteries. And in time, that line probably is going to have to go higher. So if you just take it out some future year, you're going to have to add it in, and it's going to be a bigger expense than, you know, going from zero to whatever is going to be more than going from 15 to whatever. So I just want to explain that the, uh, the, the trust fund was always viewed as something to protect if we could yeah, and not, sort of not, uh, not take money out of that. Thanks. Appreciate it. No. Alyssa. I'm going to not try and ask budget and accounting questions of Bill and Tom in a public meeting because it's probably a poor use of all of our time. But uh, that's all we What that. is your question? <laughs> no, I'm trying to, I can ask us you know, Bill, a specific question about the 2022 budget. I mean, I think fundamentally it's about different ways of reflecting the things in accounting and being not an accountant, I would like to hear their detailed perspective, but I don't think this is the venue. The, the, okay. short, the short version is if you, I showed it on the tax levy page and the second page in your whole budget packet, but the short version is if you take what's in front of you and add in 45,000 to revenue, You've got about 62 grand in revenue and 89 in expenses. So your taxpayer dollars are tw about 27. Mm -hmm. That's what would go into the cemeteries in 2024. You can take less from the trust, but you're then raising your tax rate. Mike, you could just note that via a footnote in, in, in the thing, but that's not <coughs> what I want to ask. I know we discussed last a meeting about robotic 
mowers. Are we going to real, really seriously look at that? Because robotic mowers don't pay, don't get paid health insurance. We don't have to pay health insurance, retirement, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think it's something to at least, you know, it may not be economical, but at least it's something that I think we should look at as a municipality. If it's a cheaper source, yeah, I think we should do it. Was, wasn't the main concern we can't prevent it from getting kidnapped? It's part of the challenge. Uh, you've also got to but if you hire a service to do that, they're responsible for, they may have some sort of a lock or something like that. that and that's not something I've found yet as someone who, who does that as a service. Oh, brings their own power. Oh, there are services that yeah. do that. They basic, they're basically leasing it out to you as a, a unit. I remember on Shark Tank, they had uh, a company that's doing I'm sure it. they are. I just haven't found It's doing it yet. nationally. Mike, it's perhaps you could uh, look at some of their past conditions of Shark Tank and identify. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Any other questions on cemetery at this point? We can, of course, come back and we'll visit this, uh, but I think we have uh, the issues in front of us right now. I uh, don't have to go all of them right now. Okay, let's move on to uh, general government. Okay. Um, starting with the, with the revenues, um, tax interest and penalty, um, 2024 numbers are, are pretty comparable to 2023. Um, penalty is applied once a year, so that wouldn't wouldn't change as we finalize 2023 and get the accounting done. Um, the 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 0 0.2 type, 0 0.225 of 1% of school taxes um, that may go up a bit depending on school taxes, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a pretty pretty rational figure I think. Um, the village admin service fee is, is formulaic at this point. That may change a little bit, but that's that's town to, to EFUD money. Um, the um, pilot money, um, so in 2023, we had a $40,000 surplus of pilot. Um, the, the increase in 2024 is based on an estimate um, for a pretty conservative estimate for some of the new towns that are pilots that went in place over the past year. Um, so I think that's, despite an increase um, from the actual and a big increase from the prior year budget, I think it's pretty reasonable. Um, the forest and parks money and the current use uh, money, uh, those are based on the actuals, and those are pretty pretty set amounts every year. The state has to appropriate them, but they haven't, um, they haven't not done that um, for a long, long time, and I think that would be a, a sea change if they hit those sources for towns. Um, despite their difficult budget, because there's a lot of towns where it's a much bigger number than us, although we are a sizable number. Um, going down a little further, town quirks fees, those are reduced um, to be consistent with the actual for this year. A lot of that's driven by uh, property sales and refinancings, and um, there's no inventory in the market, no one's refinancing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it makes sense to, to reflect the actuals. Um, historical society is, is tied directly to, to their expenses. Um, it's been a smaller number in prior years. In 2023, um, it went up. Um, they hired someone on a part-time basis um, that they are paying for. So that person's on our payroll. We actually, we actually just today sent them the final 2023 bill. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's going to continue and that they have the money to continue that, at least at the current rate, but if that revenue is reduced, the expense is reduced, so it's a, it's a net zero in the end. Um, the debt service is, is generally based on actuals. The $50,000 shown there is, is essentially the, the skimming of the 5% from, from tax stabilization. Uh, but overall, the real change in the revenues boils down to the uh, you know, a big increase in the pilot, um, some reduction in court fees, um, and better interest earnings. We go to general government expenses. Um, no substantial changes. Um, going forward, I want to change some of the accounting. Um, we used to show the quirk. Um, and only the clerk, and we have a clerk and an assistant clerk, and so I want to show them 
together because I think that makes sense to really um, show the department more or less as one. Um, did include some ongoing um, expenses for uh, Tom Drake's position. Assuming his work is, is going to continue into 2024. Um, about 400 hours of his work, um, so um, you know, less than 10 hours a week on average, but that, I think that's um, about what we can expect unless there's another flood, in which case something else would happen. Um, health insurance is, of course, a very big number. Um, it's, it's going down, that's the luck of the draw on who you hire and the plans they take, um, but it's still an awful big number. Um, no, other, no other huge changes going down. I do want to note towards the bottom, senior citizens are not asking for anything extra. Um, and I do want to note further down that the, the money to the cemetery fund showed here is just showing in a different place in the budget in mm -hmm. 2024. Um, as we go into the second page. Can I, sorry, uh, yeah. to the full building operating fund, is that being shown elsewhere or are we just choosing not? Don't you? A second. Minus 17.5 right above general government fuel gasoline. Not That's just down. So we, we, have, we have a reserve fund built up there. So we're in some prior years, we funded the we funded the cost of a building plus a reserve, and then we're just funding the cost to operate the building. Okay. What, what is that line you're talking about, please? That is line, uh, that is to MBOF. It is 56088 in 2024. Which is just down from what was budgeted in 2023. Oh, so essentially, see. but I'm just acknowledging that's proposing just covering costs, not yep. saving. Um, going to the next page, the RW expenses um, at 91,000. Um, we had some of that in planning and development, so it's out of their budget and, and moved it here, um, just consolidated in one place. Then there's big changes, and that's the ARPA funds that were used last year um, that came out of this year's budget. Um, on the public safety side, I was actually going to meet with them this morning. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I didn't want to interrupt you. We have a line item that has no name. It's just twenty thousand dollars, but there's no. Oh, line. sorry. That's uh, Stowe Street Alleyway and Senior Kitchen should be moved up a line. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good catch. Um, public safety. I was actually going to meet with the state police today to try to um, get some get some final numbers there, but um, Charles Wynn has the flu. Oh. So that was that was delayed. Um, but their presence, the new officer presence, has been felt. Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, I think the current team they have is really good. I've got both positive and negative reviews, so <laughs> yeah. I think they're Depending working. Depending on whether they, yeah. they got a warning or a ticket, <laughs> <laughs> or, what, or, or what bar they were frequenting. Uh -huh. So the police contract expires June thirtieth. Um, so the, the increase um, would only be felt for the final two quarters of the year, but nonetheless, that gave us a pretty healthy buffer, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have any indication that they will be asking for an increase? I know that you've, you, you assume that they will, but uh, State Police offers service to virtually every community uh, in the state. Uh, we're the only one that has a contract with them. Uh, Other towns have contracts, but they're generally hourly based with uh -huh. a set amount of hours for things like patrol. Um, uh -huh. So there's a lot of contract models out there. Ours is unique in that it's you know, two full-time people. Right. Um, you know, they think they generally request reasonable increases of other towns. Um, but we've had a contract for three years that effectively had almost three, ze almost three years of zero in it. Right. I so guess it makes sense to... Trying to, trying to hedge here and be a little careful. Mm -hmm. um, the ambulance service side is another um, pretty big decision. Um, so I've met with them several times. Um, proposal here increases their per capita fee to $35 per capita. That's still... Um, that's up from 26? Up from 26. So it's, it's a big increase that's still pretty consistent with um, the range of costs you see statewide. Um, you see some, 
some areas of the state, there's a lot of ambulance service consolidation, and that's driven down rates a little bit, but, but not much. I mean, that has been without its, its peril in its own right. Um, ambulances, I think, in, in rural America, not just Vermont, but in rural America, have been in flux and change and struggling for a few decades now. Um, I think it's going to continue to be the case. Um, if the federal and state governments decide to increase Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement rates consistent with the rate of inflation, um, then we'll be able to increase our budget consistent with the rate of inflation. But until that occurs, which has not happened in a long, long time, mm -hmm. um, the only other option WASI has is to uh, charge a town more um, and seek other business, and they are trying to seek some other business, and they are pretty aggressive about that. Yeah. Um, but to give an idea, um, you know, this year they've had some, um, they've had some help. They've they've got some extra funding unplanned for things like vaccination clinics. But if you were to strip that out of the budget, because that can never be counted on, uh, to break even, Wazi would need to charge us about fifty bucks per capita. So I think that's a number we're going to have to work towards over the next couple of years. And it's really none of that is about their new building. The new building, I think, is going to help retain staff and actually get some revenue. Um, it's operational costs. Yeah. So, you know, another fifteen bucks per capita would be seventy-five grand, roughly. Uh, is, ouch. is this? I, I guess my fear with with trying to reach that fifty dollars threshold is that it sort of works like inflation and like minimum wage, right? You know, state house was like, well, we're going to be at 15 at this year, but now our inflation rate has exploded and now 15 is no longer, right? So if we're at 50 right now, we're trying to reach that. Who's to say in a few years, it's not going to be 75. I mean, I think part of their challenge was they, they charged so little for so long. I mean, if you go back even just to 2020, I mean, they charged us you know, less than eight bucks per cap. Um, when I think statewide, the average is probably closer to 30. Because they were doing uh, outside fundraising, or what? Maybe 2020 is not the best year, because mm -hmm. I'm sure they got a lot of COVID money. Uh, yeah. But in general, their per capita fee has been very, very low. And Waterbury got a great deal for years. Now we're catching into market, I think. Yeah. The other piece we have to prepare for is, um, and actually the DRB just approved their permit um, last week, um, but when they open their new building, we get about a $20,000 cr um, credit on the WASI bill because we pay the full dispatch bill for the town, and that's, that's prorated. So their, their share of that is, is, in essence, reflected in this number. So when they move to a new building, we have a $20,000 cost increase for that alone. And that gets paid out Sorry. of which budget? Sorry, I got confused. Yeah. Um, it's, the dispatch doesn't change. We get a credit because we own the building there right. and now, so we get sort of a lease credit, if you will. Okay. So that's where the 20 grand arises from. The dispatch will stay the same. All right. Thank you. You asked my question, Kane, thanks. Mm. <laughs> no problem. So you the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then municipal building. Um, so the auditors um, requested that all debt be consolidated in the general fund. And that's what's in the operating funds, not in capital funds. And that's what's been done here. So in this whole building, um, the debt that was in there last year is in different lines in the general fund and, and split between the general fund and the library um, mm -hmm. based on, um, I believe, based on square footage. It's roughly 50-50, but not quite. Um, so that, that expense is out. But the, the short way to think of the municipal building fund is um, it's about 122 grand to uh, maintain the building. Um, it's funny because at this time last year, we were dealing with heating issues where we were going to blow the budget. Um, sort of having that same thought right now because we're still dealing with heating issues. Beginning of this month, we had essentially no heat over there, and now the heat won't shut off. We're hoping this week they'll find that balance and, and get it right, but it's been a been a bit of a stream of challenge. Bill Woodruff has said to me that um, the thing that keeps us up at night is not necessarily another flood or a big snowstorm. It's, it's at this building. It just hmm. gives him his, his share of headaches and, and heartburn. Um, so hopefully we can iron out some of these issues. I, I tend to think, you know, we're, we're past the warranty period for the heating system by about a year. Um, hmm. 
Hmm. I tend to think mm -hmm. if we get another, and, and truth be told, over the summer it was fine, but I tend to think if we get a third winter under our belts and we still struggle mightily with the system, we're going to have to rethink things a little bit and maybe have a capital project that's beyond maintenance. I don't know what that means at this point. Mm -hmm. Heat um, pumps. I'm not quite sure. It's what we had. We have heat pumps. That's the problem. That's doing the thing. They're super cheap and efficient um, when they work. But the problem is we've had a couple couple leaks in the vacuum seal, and those are expensive. Um, part of the problem is heat doesn't work, or it doesn't work for part of the building, and it goes double time on the other part. And, and, and Woody goes upstairs, and and you know the machine has a code, and, he, and, and the code says, you know, Z197, and he has to call the technician in, in Texas who has to figure out what code Z197 is and then find a local tech to fix it, and it's... It's almost like over-designed. It's, <laughs> I don't know that it's over-designed or not, I'm not an expert in these things, but it's, it's quite complex, let's put it that way. Um, so it, it's not something we can fix, you know, the, the library today, did a little cooking thing and they tripped a circuit because they had six waffle irons plugged in. We can fix that. We can, okay. we can flip the circuit back. The building's pretty tough. Um, so that's that's a challenge. What's going on in the library? And then on the final page here is the Health and Human Service. Um, kept some money in there for the community service officer, which is where we pay an animal control officer, mm. if we can find one, um, or if we want to find one, mm -hmm. um, which is a different conversation, and then the, um, which is minimal, but we struggled to find that position for a lot of years, so I'm, I'm sort of assuming that my success will be no better than anyone else's. Um, the big expense on the bottom, the public health expense, uh, that is uh, funding for Washington County Mental Health. Uh, but in the end, it's a pretty minor cost center. Um, after the dog control hearing, we'll redouble our efforts to try to find an animal control officer and do what we can uh, to make some strides there. And, and Alyssa and Karen and I sat last week and tried to figure out some potential updates to the ordinance that might help us on the fees. So we'll bring something back to you, um, hopefully around the end of the month, if not early February. Okay. Um, and then we are on to... Any questions on this? The public health of the Washington County, that's above and beyond what their special article request is. Okay. I don't think they have, they don't have a... Right. They don't, they don't have a special article. Okay, I thought they had a special article. Well, they have a page in the book. They, 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 they okay. sit here reporting. I know they're in the report. Yeah, so. but they're, they're not a special article. Okay, thanks. <coughs> on the... On the recreation side, um, broke this out into different cost centers. Um, pool had a had a difficult year um, this past year, <laughs> generally due to the weather. So we're assuming our, our our pool revenue recovers to to about the historical average. Um, and we've we've spent a lot of time and, and struggled mightily trying to figure out the pay issue. Um, and we've even discussed, which I don't believe we're going to do, but we've even discussed having pool hours without staff, which some municipal pools actually do. Our insurer hates the idea, but some pools have essentially a sign that says swimming your own risk, and they have certain hours, for instance, just for adults where you can yeah, swim. Yeah, like adult swim. Yeah. But we're, we're putting pressure there on trying to be reasonable about, about the staffing levels. You know, the pool manager, to her credit, um, wants to run a really top-notch program and wants to make sure people are a thousand percent safe. Um, you know, I've made the argument that, you know, if the pool is open just for the swim team, for example, presumably um, they're pretty capable swimmers and presumably the coaches are pretty actively involved and so maybe one lifeguard is playing. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've had those conversations to, to try to control cost. Um, but the pool, in essence, um, in your average year, is probably going to cost about 50, which is what we budgeted. Um, you won't find a municipal pool that's summer only in Vermont that operates at profit. 
or break even. They all have some cost basis to them. And that's just the reality of running an eight week pool. Um, we talked about last year, and we've, we're talking about now trying to um, trying to work hard to expand hours and increase public use. Um, but in general, that that's been tried a lot in the past and hasn't really worked all that well. We'll keep trying. Doesn't mean we won't try, but um, I don't think we're going to dramatically exceed our revenue number by by figuring out some some magic formula of staying open at certain times. Um, really, the pool is fundamentally about the day camp program. Right. when it's voted with kids. Um, going down a little further, showing the revenues for the non-pool programs. Um, numbers are a little above um, 2023 actuals, but we think very achievable, and we've also had a lot of conversations about uh, rate increases, um, in part because now we, we finally executed and have two full-time FTEs. Um, but I also think that with the staff we have, we're going to deliver a higher quality program. Um, so I think this idea of, you know, essentially $100 per week for uh, what amounts to 50 hours a week uh, for your for your child to be in, in rec camp is it's going to have to change. It's not going to have to change dramatically, um, uh, but it's certainly going to change and then above the rate of inflation. Um, and I think similar things for after school program. Um, they're also working pretty hard to, to do little things and identify new revenue sources. Um, you know, simple, the simple one they're already working on is um, school and service days, where we can be open and take kids at our rest facility. Mm -hmm. Snow days are, are tough enough to track because they're unplanned and we sometimes need the high school kids. And since they can't plan any better than the schools can, we can't Often necessarily less. be open, but planned in service days, we can we can work around that school schedule and, and, and snag some revenue that way. Um, but the salaries, um, so the salaries are reflective of the, the two full-time year-round people we have now. Um, summer program pay is above 2023 budget, but below actual because um, our, our second full-time person is going to be full-time managing the summer program and will be there. So that's a big, that's a big part of it. Um, then the minicamp pay is, is pretty consistent with, with last year's budget. Um, some of the um, summer program pay, I think we're going to make an accounting entry in 2023 and move it into minicamp. Um, but overall, the, the payroll for for rec non pool programs, um, it's about 315 grand, 320 grand. Um, so pretty, pretty big number, um, but pretty substantially offset by the by the revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I the way I tend to think of these programs is, you know, at our at our peak, um, I think we enrolled 168 kids last year. That doesn't mean they were all enrolled for the full eight weeks, but that was. That was the peak in theory of who could show up one day. That's probably a bit high. Um, but then the last 150, 160 kids, and you're talking, um, I think, good, quality, safe, fun, and childcare for what amounted to 100 bucks a week last year. That's a pretty darn good deal. Um, right. That's been way below the private market. Um, so it, it's not going to be 100 a week this summer, but it, it's not going to be 200. It might be 115 a week. The other piece we're trying to figure out is that I guess I guess it's two years now where our system crashed the day parents registered their kids, and so we have. And, and this past year it was actually done on town meeting day when registration opened. So one, we're not going to open registration on town meeting day, and, and we're also going to work with the vendor to see if we can stagger registration and perhaps have Waterbury residents get first bite at the apple. Uh -huh. We didn't turn away anyone last year, but. I think there was a perception from a lot of parents that the system crash couldn't register a kid and they thought they would be locked out and wouldn't have a place for their kid to go for the summer. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that'll be the issue, but I, I'd like to find a way to give, you know, perhaps Waterbury residents a couple days to register and then open it up to non-residents. So you're not having registration on town meeting day? No. Because <laughs> all I did was get phone calls on town meeting day that I couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. So. You, I was at the school getting phone calls. Yeah, so. 
it's not that's a good a real, idea. That deviates from years and years and years of that. So um, I, I, I just Katarina don't need to get word out. I just don't think it's a good practice. Maybe Katarina will, will convince me, but could we do like it before town meeting done? I think we could. I think a week is, is going to be fine. That, that would avoid getting lots of complaints at town meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not, just to add to that, I'm not so sure it matters what day it is. It's the, it's the popularity of the program, it's the affordability of the program. So no matter what day it is, yeah. there's going to be issues around that, that software crashing. Um, and we've, right. Over the years in the office, we've had all kinds of conversations about how to stagger it yep. by age group or last name, but then you get families who have kids that mm -hmm. may have two last names, may have yep. two age groups. Um, so I think a change is warranted for sure because it's crashed two yeah. if not three years. Um, but I don't think it's going to matter if it's town meeting day or the Friday before or what it is. It's just a, just a popular program. Yeah, just a popular program. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the affordability is uh, one of the key elements of its popularity. Mm -hmm. Sure, for sure. Um, going down further to the next page, um, no, no big changes in the, the rest of the, the rent expenditures. Um, the, the, the amount in line, uh, I think it was 84 that we're sending to the capital fund is, is just sufficient to cover the fund expenses, but we're not, we're not building that fund. There's no, um, in part because um, I like the idea of building a capital fund um, if you're going to pay cash or make a meaningful down payment towards something, but in REC, um, you know, the big thing facing us is going to be the pool and, you know, building an extra 20 grand a year for a couple of years, um, and that decision from you is almost going to be a rounding error in the context of whatever the pool costs. Um, well, I guess I'd say in practice, we've used that for a lot of other things in the past, like yeah. lights on the ball field, things that are... Yeah, and the capital fund has a balance. Yeah. So, so we've got some, some money there if needed. Um, not too good word about that um, in the short term, and Katarina's pretty aggressive about applying for grants. Um, on, to the, on to the parks maintenance side, um, we essentially uh, budget here a half time, half time of the public works employee to do parks maintenance all summer um, and some part time pay. Um, We've got some money in there. It's less than last year, in part because we struggled to find people. So we feel like it's a reasonable amount to put in there, uh, just based on the labor market and what we can do and find. Um, and then the grounds maintenance of twenty thousand is is pretty consistent with our historical costs. Um, in general, just materials and, and, and stuff they need for all the ball fields uh, related to that. Um, it's not in here is the soccer field um, up, at, the center? up at the ice center. Um, we own the field. We are going to um, put some work out to bid for that field um, in a few months. But the, the current plan is that that's a FEMA project. The town owns the field. And uh, the soccer club would cover the town's match. Uh -huh. So it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a town expense related to that. Um, and I think that's essentially part of the lease agreement we have with them. Mm -hmm. Going down um, a little further, um, we've got some, some new lines in the parks budget, um, which are just maintenance items. So they were moved out of the, the recreation capital fund because I view them more as, as maintenance and not capital so much. Um, but nothing huge. The, the short version of parks is, is about $100,000 to maintain your parks, and I think that's going to stay relatively consistent over the years. Um, could perhaps see some increases if we add parks, which we've actually had conversations about. Um, Going down, uh, so so and just going down to that. still holding on to that uh, park maintenance uh, fund. Uh, they are. Mm -hmm. They indeed are. We uh, had a meeting on, on Wednesday, but yeah, they're they're holding on to the parks maintenance. Do they have fund. any plans for that spending? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. they indeed do. Um, 
I realize uh, if, it's if, a different municipality, but I'm just curious. EFUD had uh, sharp rate increases in 2023. Um, my preview of the 2024 budget is there will again be a need for some rate increases, not quite as sharp, but, mm -hmm. but EFUD has some financial needs, so I, I think. Um, I think it's probably a pretty hard ask for EFA to give up that, okay. that amount. Um, and then from, yeah, it's, uh, let's just leave it at that. We'll have to, go ahead. Um, so so the, way to, the way I think of REC is if you go to line 117 on the final page, the net, the net impact of all programs um, is $311,000 in the budget, very consistent with 2023 budget. And I think we can achieve that through pretty careful management of, of the summer expenses um, and trying to balance out some reasonable rate increases for the summer. And then also the rec staff pursuing every little opportunity they can to get extra money, like the, you know, like can we expand and do snow day coverage and, and other programs like that. Um, and they're working hard at that. So I think that's an achievable number, but the short version is that's what your, that's what your rec department costs you. Um, I think of it in large part as a, as a child care subsidy. Mm -hmm. um, going down a little further, um, the capital fund, that $26,000 in the revenue that goes in is just money from the rec budget. Um, and then we have uh, in here, the, the big item for the year is where um, we've got $20,000 uh, for accessibility improvements and that would be matching funds uh, for hopefully a successful grant application. Um, and if not, we could perhaps just start that project on our own or wait for a future year and try to apply again for other grants. But that's the, that's the hope. Um, and the rest is, is smaller, smaller items, um, which are relatively consistent with prior years. Um, sometimes the capital items are, are things that arise during the course of the year. You just do the best you can. Um, but hope to AV is, is the first phase, hopefully the first phase, given there was a study done, I think we're in a pretty, pretty good position to get grants uh, based on the study. Mm -hmm. So that's the hope. Right. And uh, do we uh, know when we're going to hear about that grant application? Um, I don't know offhand, I'll have to get that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a couple of months. Melissa, do you know? I think it's a couple months, like not before April. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Other questions? Uh, Lisa. I just want to pick up on what Karen said about the recreation camp sign up on the next time we visit. As far as the public information goes, that's the I want to change it real bad. Maybe my rec, my rec staff might disagree with me, but right. well, I had 15 messages after town meeting day ended. Oh, I totally, I totally get it. You would be really hard to multitask on that. However, to move it before town meeting day would probably not be a great move because school break is that week. Mm -hmm. The first day back to school is um, town meeting day. This is the day after town meeting day. So, like, if you put it in that week of school vacation, that would I'll probably break the too. So just to think about not putting it during the school vacation would probably be a good idea. I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah. Melissa? Off topic, Bo Rec is March 1, where we're both incorrect. Is March 1. March 1? Yeah, oh, so we'll, we will know by uh, town meeting day. Yeah, my, my only thought in terms of me uh, <coughs> opening it before uh, town meeting day would be to lessen the burden uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if people were paying attention uh, they could be the early get the early bird special people pay attention we've got once you're in the system we can send an email blast to everyone in the system yeah I mean I appreciate the fact that people will be on vacation some people won't be here but uh, it would perhaps dissipate the the big flood of signups and if there we're taking everybody that applies, at least we have this past year, uh, that isn't a huge concern that people are going to get frozen out. Yeah, so. yeah Mike. 
I just want to give a big shout out to the rec department. I think they're doing a great job, and our town's folks should be really, because I think they're getting a service for a relatively reasonable amount of money. Uh, I know some people think it's expensive, but if I look at it compared to daycare, it's probably cheap. But, but my thought is that any programs we should have town residents, because the town's paying for a lot of these costs, town residents should always get preferences. Just my thought. Also. And I would also just note, especially with our new director, there is a lot of programming that addresses all ages, just to say as a 28-year-old, like there's yoga and earring making and painting, and just I also just want to caution us to not conflate this entire budget to child care, while recognizing it is largely that. I just think, especially now, there is no, more emphasis all, on all serving all ages and also including parks that serve a huge number of residents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll still lobby for the Fiber Center versus Village uh, Chicago. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> As a rack fundraiser? Oh, that would be fun. I just want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you uh -huh. <laughs> I think you get a bigger crowd in the summer. Uh, and Tom, you're still available to meet uh, with the rec committee um, on Thursday. Yep. To talk about Anderson Field planning. Okay. Anderson complex. All right. Any other questions on anything that uh, Tom has presented on the budget? Hearing none, well, let's move forward. Um, I guess this is the uh, part where we were looking to have uh, discuss uh, Tom's testimony uh, on behalf of the town uh, to um, about flood recovery. So Senate uh, Government Operations, um, they essentially want to know, was the government flood response effective or interaction with <laughs> levels of government Don't smooth, what could be done better in the future, and how we can make government itself more resilient, et cetera. Um, I have 10 minutes max. Um, mm -hmm. Who's the chair of that committee? Uh, I don't know, because I think it changed this past year. I'll certainly know by Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> we don't want to. Uh, we want to be, make this constructive, right? So, uh, ten minutes of complaining probably isn't going to achieve that goal. I think the biggest point I want to make is, and, and Brian brought it home. Um, there's a complexity to, to all the state programs and all the funding sources, and we might miss out on some funding in the short term, there's only next year, but it's nice to get things off the ground now. Um, because of that complexity, we don't have you know, a full-time grant writer or anyone who can step into the void. Um, you know, so the focus after the flood, after the cleanup, was the FEMA court which is its own challenge. Um, you know, I think what I might want to say is in an ideal world, it would be nice if someone from the state came to Waterbury and said, tell us your story and, and, and brought the team of you know, a half dozen state employees and said, OK, well, these are the funding programs you want to apply for. Here's your deadlines. Um, make it a little bit easier for you, given we don't necessarily have any staff to, to, to do these things above, above and beyond staff that are full time employed. So that's, that's, I think, a big part of my message. Um, the other part of my message is we're, we're six months out from the flood, um, and there, there's, been, there's been no regional conversation directed by the state about the flood. 
feel like that's a little bit overdue at this point. Um, so, you know, several people during, during, the present, during Brian's presentation talked about a regional approach, but I think the state's got to lead with that, um, and that, that thus far just hasn't occurred. Um, I know they've, um, they've created a, I'll call it a flood czar position, um, and the gentleman I've talked to is in that position, it's great. Um, but those are, I think, the big challenges that I see. Um, you know, having worked in, in a different state where there's county government, I kept thinking that over and over during this flood is it's, it's easier to deal with these natural disasters when there's one entity that, that has a real broad geographic look to the region and can coordinate all the resources. On the uh, glass half full side, uh, I thought Brian's presentation was excellent. Yeah. You know, I yeah. really appreciate him coming prepared, presenting us very clear opportunities, and even giving us uh, sort of a roadmap for moving forward. Uh, and and to be clear, he's not state government. <laughs> yeah. Just, just say it out loud, I just want to say. <laughs> but, you know, maybe we'll that, some funding that is a, <laughs> sort of a vision to what's possible. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think that would be worthy of mention. Danny. Um. Tom, I noticed your last on the um, list of uh, of the agenda. So I don't know if you're actually last. But you can you can leave a big uh, a big impression. Um, I think you know, and Joe, I'm just bringing up like what Bill and Liz and Tom were sort of talking about is like that patchwork of available funding, and that even our most knowledgeable and dedicated folks who are volunteering are still feeling like they're running around in circles. And so I'm not sure, you know, the direct, succinct question, but just the mention of like how difficult it is without that coordination and um, that just the funding piece in particular that had come up. And I suppose if I could look back, um, in a perfect world, I probably would have gone, to, would have come to the select board in July or August and said maybe we need to hire a position to, to grant right. To, to go through all those things. Um, I feel like now we've got a better handle on it, so we can get it done, especially with Brian's help. But I, I wish, in retrospect, that that's what have been something I would have brought to you. I feel like that was a mistake on my part. Doug, you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah I, I just want to offer an observation. I've, I've been on the Regional Planning Commission now for several months. And in the course of reading staff reports every month in preparation for our commissioner's meeting, at the very granular level, you'll see the town names of what the, the Planning Commission staff are doing for the town. Not all of the towns appear there. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Regional Planning Commission is a resource that not all of its members take advantage of and has the ability to do the sort of thing that Brian did for us this evening. So I would encourage us to, to, to be, I don't want to say aggressive, but to be cognizant of that resource and use it in ways that we can for this fund. Melissa. I don't know if this is within the scope of the testimony, and I want to keep the positive framing, but I guess to like borrow a bit of a Ted Brady conversation from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, he always talks about towns are being asked to do more, and I guess kind of my, like, one of my big takeaways both in July and December was kind of the dichotomy between community sentiment and community needs and capital M municipal government needs and sentiment. I mean, maybe most pronounced in this most recent December meeting where kind of you gave the like 24 hour municipal update, which was, you know, yep, roads are in good shape, culverts are in good shape, kind of we're fine. <laughs> and then we had volunteer coordinators saying there's imminent needs with 60 households. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure we frame it in the framing of state government response, but I guess it's figuring out, you know, I think towns, or at least our town, at least in July, took on the purview of providing more support and did a lot of that through incredible volunteer resource. And I want to honor that and then say that like my reflection on how state engaged with that is that maybe they didn't always recognize that. You know, there was systems of the RPC calling you to ask about roads and ask about damage. And um, I don't know that that just as a municipality, I was struck by you have these kind of two separate systems with two different mm -hmm. needs, and I don't know that 
there was a whole lot of coordination in general, but to the extent that there was, that it recognized those different roles, and in my view, kind of both sides could be strengthened. There's the piece you're speaking to about okay. grant rating, and I would also just frame, I think, like, water break, like, we have more capacity than most towns I work with professionally, like, the fact that we have a, a you know, town manager, so the fact that you're still saying there's a huge need um, just really strikes me, you know, knowing that, like, we're not a volunteer, so we're doing it all on our own. Um, but yeah, in terms of things on the ground, I think, like, there was volunteer resources or things, and we've kind of had conversations about whether everything going through an emergency management director makes sense, but um, I guess my closing thought would be around transparency, around how the state wants us to coordinate information or use resources. I will say, in this last event, I heard more clearly in the press conferences, and maybe I just didn't hear it before, but like, if you have needs, they need to go to your emergency management director, and they need to go to the SEOC, but I think about instances like not knowing they were using cleanup crew or putting 211 in data. I think if there was more knowledge of how the state operated and what systems it's used, shared by all, both municipal and volunteer in our case, or all those other things, there would just be more thought about how you could plug in effectively to the system. Um, that's me off the cuff, so I also just want to like say that I personally I'm comfortable with you also having a conversation with like Lish Lagle and getting her thoughts, not to say take them all, but I guess that dichotomy is what I strike from a municipal perspective. And Tom, uh, you and I met with Liz uh, last Friday. Uh, one of her points was that uh, she feels that uh, the, uh, there's a general lack of awareness about 211 how it works, why it's important, and one of the impacts of that was that uh, Washington County was left off the most recent uh, request for uh, FEMA uh, emergency funding uh, in the December incident. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to have an impact on us as a, as a community. Uh, Bill, you had your hand up? Yeah, to that point, Roger. Um, Tom Drake just posted on Front Porch Foreman in the last couple of days asking people, please report to 211. It's not too late to do that. Uh, so so uh, folks should. Uh, I, I think, Tom, you're being a little too hard on yourself in terms of going back to last summer and deciding that we need a grant ready or whatever. I mean, in the in the heat of the moment, so to speak, you do what needs to be done, and there was a lot of things going on. And thinking back to Irene, uh, what I feel is different, and I'm not intimately involved except through crew, is that uh, there's not been a lot of disaster recovery initiatives put forward by the state yet. I talked the other day about you know the, the disaster recovery fund. And they're, they're kind of still haven't got any money out the door yet. But um, we didn't, we weren't able to get, uh, you know, Barb Farr, I think it was 2013 before she started. I mean, the flood was in 2011, and we applied for uh, CBG, DR grants, and things like that. And we didn't get that funding until late in uh, 2012. And, and uh, 2013. What we did have, and, and I've asked this question before, is uh, you know AmeriCorps and Vista volunteers. Uh, that program, they haven't really stepped up to, in my uh, mind, as to what they did the last time. And we had three excellent young people that uh, provided big assistance to the municipality, and I wish they would get on. on Know, if there's something out that could be used to, to help because uh, they were tremendous staff resources that you know we we paid I think it was like six or eight thousand dollars a year for 40 hours a week for those positions and we had them for three years so uh, that's those are things that I think are lacking right now Thank you. Roger. Other input? Yeah, Chris. So, Tom, I just want to clarify. You're testifying in front of who? Uh, Senate Operations. Okay. Um, I was going to keep this under the lid, but for what it's worth, um, and I don't know if you can use this to our advantage, 
I received a phone call today from the secretary of the head of the agency of transportation in reference to my concerns about the aggregate issue that we're faced with. Um, I was told that they would pursue it and do what they can to try to see it through. But if you can, from your avenue, put yet more pressure on, uh, it, and it brought to mind the conversation I had with her was lengthy, but you brought to mind more issues that the urgency of having a quarry would help out with is it, during a flood, the response time to repair roads and get aggregate to those damaged areas, you know, because we don't know where our aggregate resources might be and whether or not they're even available, because I know that McCullough is absolutely out of everything right now. Um, well, and even if we've got a stockpile, river road floods. I mean, getting access to those other quarries being this distance away they are, uh, you know, be advantageous from that perspective to have our own place where we where we could get it. Mm -hmm. So if you can use that as any kind of leverage to kind of pile on from another avenue, the importance of of that resource it might it might open some doors for us. Okay. Okay. All right, I think he's probably got enough input because we gave him 15 minutes and he's only got 10 minutes to speak, so there we go. Um, you can watch it online as a note, yeah. if you choose. Be excited. Um, that's going to be tomorrow, right? Mm. Tomorrow? It's Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. 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 Sorry, I was, yeah, well, I was looking at the whole week. agenda. Yeah, we, we're not quite at midnight yet, so. <laughs> yeah. um, 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Wednesday. 1.30? Okay, and that's uh, Senate operations. Okay, let's uh, talk about next meeting. I think they're looking pretty full up. Huh? Well, maybe not certificate of highway mileage, but. That'll be Monday, 22nd. Um, and again, uh, just a point of order, Danny, uh, you are available to chair yes. if I just Sorry. zoom in as a uh, innocent member. <laughs> innocent, yes. Okay. Are you uh, coming in under an alias? Like <laughs> yeah, so Andy's got his iPod and a big fake mustache. Walkie talkie. Uh, there you go. Uh, so. Uh, and we've got uh, Joe is uh, ready as far as we know to make his presentation. I believe he's already sent a draft out to the committee. Um, yeah, and the library will need some time. Mm -hmm. um, I met with them today. How did it go? They, they had a, they, the meeting continued after I left, um, but they're, um, they're struggling with their own, with the library trust fund. And so, it's too bad. Um, Okay. Whether they whether whether they agree with the budget proposal or not, it's a good conversation to have between both boards. I think. Um, yeah. And they're going to be there, right? Uh, yeah, they're they're twenty seconds should be plenty of time for them. Okay. And then uh, revitalizing Waterbury and Senior Center, uh, they're looking for flat budgets. I highlighted them because I'm not. Sure, that we need to have this. Yeah, if they don't want, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a contested issue. Uh, do you think, uh, Dom? It's certainly not contested, so I don't think we need to have them here. If you if you wanted them, they're certainly happy to come. Um, I, I don't know. Anyone feel like we need to talk with them if they're just asking essentially for flat budgets or? said this to Tom before, but I guess it's like we use the budget de facto to do kind of our annual updates. So I do yeah, feel strongly that. like having been an employee for revitalizing Waterbury, like they should come and present to us and we should hear about what they're doing. I don't feel it needs to be on January 22nd to defend their budget proposal. Um, 
or I would take her and she'd come and she'd be mad at me, but I digress. Um, <laughs> but, and ditto with like the senior center, you know, had ARPA funding for the kitchen. So to be clear, I, I don't have qualms with the outline in the budget or feel they need to be there the 22nd. Maybe I would propose for an agenda item on the 29th. Mm -hmm. We have a conversation about regular check-ins with groups like them. I mean, again, they tend to send the six month update, but I'm okay with foregoing it in the budget context, but not in an overall annual check-in context. Okay. I would agree. Knowing how much we've got going on this month, it might be better suited another time. So it would help me with a more specific directive. We're going to move them to the first agenda in February. Well, making sure Roger agrees before we. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. Uh, in fact, I would prefer, honestly, uh, to uh, talk with them uh, about their uh, annual plans, uh, if it's not specifically budget-related, uh, and uh, we could spend a little bit more time perhaps talking about the, the economic development proposal, because they essentially uh, revitalizing Waterbury is our economic development uh, uh, a committee um, and then the senior center unless people feel that there are particular things that we want to hear from them I would uh, say we should schedule in no time go ahead Mike we should probably just keep them on the agenda but really not have I don't think they need to be here I think it's better to be there but just have the numbers and just go over the numbers very very quickly and cursory and just say we all kind of agree on Yes, I'll just say as someone who used to work for an organization, if I'm on an agenda, I sure as heck am going to be at that meeting. Just personal, that's my personal view. So that's fine, don't, but don't if, well if the intent is for them to not come, personally, I would. I mean, we can specify, but. Well, we have to discuss the budget. Okay. Uh, right, you have to discuss the budget, so they have to be on the agenda. I don't think you could just say, you know, flat budget, don't, don't include it. Mm -hmm. Even though it is, we, we all know that we're looking at both having flat budgets, but I think we at least have to acknowledge that and agree to that going forward with the full budget. Okay. So, uh, in uh, response to uh, Karen's request, I would say we're going to keep it on the agenda. They're welcome to be here and right. speak to, to any issues that may come up, but we will reserve uh, a opportunity to speak with them at greater length at another time. Yeah. Deal. Okay. And uh, cool. I, didn't, I didn't write this, but I thought I think it took it off of the agenda. Um, but the new provided Tom, what are we talking about with special articles? Because I want to be prepared. Do you want to see the letters of request? Um, are there any changes from last year? No. no. GMTA ride, who I just finally got in touch with. Unless you want to talk about making that not part of my job. <laughs> but I have to ask three times for an invoice. Um, but anyway, uh, no, there's it's all flat funding. So I can bring the letters of request. I think, yeah, we just review the list, same as last year. But if it's all flat, maybe, I mean, last year the conversation focused around the senior center and the increase, but also how how much of it was in the budget versus as mm -hmm. a special article. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. 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 And maybe the decision, maybe that's the conversation this year again. Is now that the increase is not an increase, do you just move it into the budget? Okay. That's mm -hmm. what you're calling entirely. Yeah. All right. And we'll talk about it uh, on the 22nd. Okay. Um, and then just to give um, where we're at in terms of the tax levy. Um, the public works budget had that $30,000 for sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I talked to Bill Woodruff um, and thought about it, um, we have no qualms about deleting that in part because it's a lot of work for his crew because to stretch your 30000 they they pull the old sidewalks. Um, and they've got other priorities that are in the roads. Um, and in part because um, the more linear feet you can bid out, the better price you get. Hmm. So it's nice to chip away at it and show some progress each year, but um, maybe it's something we save up for a few years and have a bigger project. Have a bigger project. Mm -hmm. um, but if that were to, so, so we have no um, 
you could certainly leave that in and repurpose it. Um, but if that were to come out um, and the library were to agree on the trust fund usage, um, your, your tax rate would go up um, a penny and a half, which is less than 3%. So Without the 100,000 by then? Correct. Without, Without what? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Without Tom presented a rate that was based on paying down $100,000 of debt yeah, so without, from the general fund. Without that, you would be less than 3%. Keep, my only keep that hundred thousand dry, keep your power dry, and save it for the future. Yes, I guess my only I'm struck that like <coughs> Wasi was not on the agenda tonight, and we're approving a ten dollar a nine dollar per capita <laughs> increase, which is just to say I have no problem with it, but I find this RW Senior Center. They can certainly be on the agenda. Well, no, I don't think they need to be on the agenda, tonight. nor do I think RW and Senior Center. Can. But we'll be. I'm not. It's not a hill I'm going to die on. And then on sidewalks, I guess I would just say. I felt like, Roger, you said that as a passing comment at the end of the last meeting, or maybe I interpreted the conversation wrong, but just saying, we're facing you know, pressure with school budgets, which is real and whatnot, and what choices we should make. I guess I would just say, like, if there's a desire to change the budget by $30,000, and to be clear, I defer to you and Woody more than anything, so if Woody thinks it's a good idea, great. Um, you know, He knows the crew and knows the people. I guess I wouldn't. I didn't feel like like I was going into that conversation with we need to cut something in sidewalks is what we should cut. I felt like it was kind of an afterthought comment. So if, if staff thinks it's the right thing to do, I'm not going to advocate to put it in against staff recommendation. But it wasn't like leaping off the page as like, wow, that super extravagant yeah. maintenance of sidewalks in the village. It was something we had in the budget in 2023 and didn't get to do it. Um, we wanted it in 2024, and then after some some conversation, you know, Bill Woodruff and Celia, um, you know, one of their you know one of their complaints about the Main Street project, of which sidewalks has been part of it, is that you know they lose two members of their crew for quite a bit of time pulling sidewalks, and they'd like to just have some more time for roads and especially to get some gravel road projects done. Mm -hmm. And don't they already have to do park They well? have to do some of that already. Yeah. So I mean, th there will be sidewalks yeah. done, uh, yeah. but so it's already, fine. It's already paid for. Yeah. So yeah, I'd be happy to have that uh, thirty thousand dollars disappear uh, and uh, keep uh, our price inc our tax increase as low as possible because uh, again, uh, our taxpayers uh, are going to be facing a sticker shock regardless of anything we do here. But the more that we can reduce that, uh, the better from my standpoint. Okay. Will we have a copy of the, it's on the agenda, draft warning? Will we have a copy prior to? Yeah, absolutely. Soon. We can probably get back to the 22nd. That's where it is. Mm -hmm. And then 29th is the final date, correct? Um, sorry, Roger. Um, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if this is narrative, and you mentioned you drafted a select board report. It just strikes me that we spoke to ARPA really specifically, and per the reference of Brian earlier tonight, um, you know there is five hundred thousand dollars. Of course, we've accounted accounted for it for our great. Yes, there is no lot of money. We've accounted for it, but I personally, in the way Alyssa does accounting and budgeting, feel that we have five hundred thousand dollars that was originally ARPA, um, mm -hmm. and so I'm just thinking about either addressing that. How we address that, I guess my sense is it's going to be narratively in the select board report. But um, again, just particularly in the context of our earlier discussion tonight, like there was so much focus on it last year, and we provided a plan that kind of for so at a minimum, I think it's important that we highlight how we accounted for it for general government expenses. But I right. think if we have intentions of using it for special projects in the future, which I guess is my personal proclivity, whether it's flood mitigation or something else. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's not part of like the warning, but I think we just need to make sure we address that um, or, or have a response to that for a town meeting. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I texted uh, all the members of the board, uh, I am drafting uh, a letter uh, to go into the annual report um, and uh, be glad to mention that uh, if uh, I think that we would say, A, that the ARPA monies have been incorporated into the town, so that it's, it's all part of town revenue now. Uh, it doesn't have any special 
requirements in terms of being appropriated. Uh, but that uh, we're, uh, I, personally, uh, I'd be interested in directing at least a portion of that towards flood mitigation, uh, since that's one of the things that qualifies as a local match. Mm -hmm. So is this conversation going on the next agenda? Uh, I was going to just put it into the letter that I was going to oh, submit uh, to you, since you told me I had a deadline of Friday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just try to, and, and then uh, also invite <laughs> others right. to You're the list. <laughs> feed me input. What's uh, my real day? Um, and I can send you out the sort of like the, the uh, outline of what I've got right now. <laughs> And then you can tell me if uh, I'm missing something. Makes sense. Okay. It could be a status update too, because like, there has been positive, like this bridge work was done, and this gravel will be happening this year, right. and this is how the rest of it was accounted for in future plans. Yeah. The yeah. certificate of highway mileage, I put that on today. It doesn't need 15 minutes. I think it just requires your signatures. Hmm. It's a. Old <coughs> might be it's an annual. Yeah, it's an annual. Yeah. It's a, it's a formulaic uh, part we have to complete. Are you going to? Aid for yeah. yeah. I think Woody fills it out, and I think I just have to bring it here and sign it, is my recollection. So yeah. I'll change I'll, the times. but I'll just be in by the end of next week. I won't be here for the meeting. Uh, if you need my, you can have my signature up through next week. Okay. Uh, I'll sorry. see if I can get, uh, I gave Bill Woodruff the deadline of Monday the 22nd, so I'll see if I can. See, she's yeah. giving me a deadline. The budget's not done, so I can't write that. It's a report. All right. <laughs> it's not fun. An ongoing and storied relationship between the manager. I know the real deadline. Just one, one last thing. Uh, Danny has Friday invited to uh, Skip to present EFUD oh. on the 29th. Yeah, I have that on the agenda. Thank um, you. One other final thing of, of big importance. Um, I, I responded affirmatively, and I've already got a couple people from Town Hall, but I was invited to be part of game show night for Winterfest. Oh! <laughs> they like, like a town team. I think the library might do its own. Yeah. Um, so so give, me, uh, give me a second here to give you the date. Okay. It's February 2nd, uh, Friday night, starting at 6.30. There we go. Do we have to enter by the 12th? Yeah. Is this what Natalie just told me to do? Yes, you should to get yourselves uh, registered. There's your, going to be... Your email to you just said Friday at 6. I thought it was this Friday. Well, I just it, so, yeah. Oh, no, it was the part you wrote. Are you gone? Oh, did I? I don't know. Yeah, well, just maybe clarify because I, when I read it, I deleted it because I wouldn't be available. I didn't know it was weeks so, away. Friday the 2nd, uh, starting at 6.30, I think, yeah. Getting there by six would be helpful. And it's at the Legion. They have a liquor. What they have a liquor license. I don't know what their open, what their bar is like. Uh, the bar is, the bar is, uh, is very beer. open oh. and reasonably priced. Yes, yeah, we got no, so. And there also will be a flood event on the town. Kevin has sent that to staff, right? I should have mm -hmm. said that during yes. public. I should also say, speaking of venues at the Legion that you all should come to, um, February tenth, there's a what are we calling it? What the uh, fun event, which isn't is, it a volunteer? Yeah, volunteer appreciation. But I think yeah. the select board is all duly invited and should try to attend. Um, okay. What time is that? On? I believe it's. I don't think I count that. No, there wasn't. Oh, oh, I saw okay. that. Kevin or someone to staff. Um, I'm not signed into my email. Uh, six to. I think there's going to be some broader. That's events. It. Yeah, there's. Yeah. I say they're making like a town Facebook event and whatnot. I'm just really thinking we will yeah meet again until the twenty second. So. Saturday. Yeah, I think there was a motion to adjourn. It was seconded. Yeah, Alyssa made uh, it and came second. <laughs> Alyssa. Uh, it was ten. Even, but well, you know. Ten of them. And uh, all in favor say aye. 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 aye.